again, everybody, and welcome to a thrill-packed episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. I am, of course, the aforementioned Jim Cornette, and today we're going to talk about this week's Friday Night Letdown. Will CM Punk be back in a ring anytime soon, anywhere? And who else is left in All Friends Wrestling that might plug Tony's sinking ship? And to join me in plugging a variety of things, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he makes Captain Bly look like old Tony Khan, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. I did not expect a Captain Bly reference here at the start of the show. <laughs> I'll see you hanging from the highest yadam in Daly's place. And once again, compared to Tony Khan, of all things, <laughs> Captain Bly, but it's a pleasure to be here once again. You're a, you're a draconian individual that slave drives his, his minions and demands the best of them at the risk of physical and corporate-style punishment if they don't deliver. And meanwhile, Tony's over there patting everybody on the back and hugging and smooching and everything's good. I demand the best. Everything else you said, I'm not committing to. I'm very nice to everyone who works for me. They're all wonderful people. But I demand well, the best. My my lips are chapped today, I'll have you know, for the first time since last February. It's been so fucking cold this week, and the wind's been blowing, the wind howling, the children out shivering in the cold, and now my lips are chapped just in time for it to be 80 degrees today. It was fucking 29 degrees a couple mornings ago, now it's going to be 80. It hasn't rained now, and we've had less than a quarter of an inch of rain in 40 days, and no rain at all in almost a month. Gloom, despair, and agony, oh me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony, oh me. It's going to be one of those days, Brian. Yeah, Buddy Holly did country. There it is. I had some A. Hey. I'll have you know, Peggy Sue, that After I'm... After the crash. Hey, God, Jesus Christ, that was... Is it too soon for that? <laughs> too soon, yeah. February 3rd, 1959. Let's say that would be 63. It's too soon for that. Make fun of old Buddy. People in Lubbock are going to be after you. And what do you think of the legacy of everyone on that plane? Because, you know, Buddy Holly is obviously one of the greatest legends of all time because of the influence he had on everyone and his songwriting and his production. I mean, everything he did. Richie Valens, you know, they made La Bamba, which made him a bigger star than ever before because of that film and the wonderful performance of Los Lobos in that film doing all these songs. <laughs> and the big bopper who had one kind of a novelty hit in a way, right? He was a DJ. Hello, baby. Yes, he was a DJ, the big bopper, but he had that, uh, what was his name? J.P. Richardson. He had that big, yeah. deep, booming voice. And, I mean, Richie Valens would have, would he have been, If I guess he was already, but if he had lived longer, would he have been the first real crossover Hispanic rock and roll, you know, teen idol type of thing? It would have been really interesting, especially with the way the Southern California sound developed in just the next few years, production-wise, what they would have done with him. Because we never really got to see him go much further past his initial songs. What was he, 17 years old? We never got to see yeah. anything. So who knows? It would have been either one of those guys who's a hit act as a teenage star for a couple of years, or perhaps it was a future we really have no way of knowing. And La Bamba, I've, I've, I've never told you this story because I just thought of it. Goddamn, I made Manny Fernandez mad for just mad one night he and and uh hector guerrero were working with the midnight express well back in mid-south i had briefly done an angle on tv where i managed chavo and hector guerrero against the rock and roll express and that's where they had the chavo and Her the, hector they had the bandoleros on and the sombreros yeah, the and, alamo busters yeah you know and they were at one point in one of the interviews, he's going, la, 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 bamba, you know, and they're doing all that stuff and blah, blah, blah. So the next time I saw him was like two years later, we're in Crockett and the Midnight versus Hector and Manny Fernandez, the Raging Bull. And we're 
they're getting the referee's instructions. And I looked at Hector and I go, la, 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 bamba. And, and he giggled because he knew what I was doing. But Manny thought, well, what is he being fucking, you know, pissy with the Mexicans? And what's, what's his problem with the Mexicans? And, all, you know, and Hector had it off. We could just calm down. We're doing a thing. We did this, right? But la, 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 la bamba. Uh, I was I was made an honorary Mexican that day by Hector and Chavo and got to wear the sombrero and everything. Think of it from Manny's perspective, though. He's there, he's introduced, and all of a sudden he's never seen you do this ever before. And you're playing your racket and doing little He's like, what the fuck? What is <laughs> I can understand his frustration. <laughs> uh, well, you know, Manny was often frustrated. But anyway, um, I had visitors here this past week, a variety of some expected and some unexpected. I get up Thursday morning. Do you remember we've talked before, Brian? Your your short-term memory is shot because of your, obviously, consumption of the devil's lettuce. But I've talked to you before about Bertie Sanders, right? You have, and I only smoke sativa, and I drink lots of coffee, so I'm pretty good. All right. Well, the coffee's bad for you, too. Except I understand they give coffee enemas. I've, I've read about those. I don't know how that would work, but anyway. You just hate coffee. Well, coffee is just a disgusting, I can't even call it a beverage. It's a disgusting concoction. It's, it smells. Did you ever say this to your mom? Horrible. Didn't your mom drink coffee? Yes, yes. That's why every time I'd open the door to my room to come downstairs and go to the bathroom, I'd smell in the morning, I'd smell the coffee, and, ah, and I'd go back and close the door. What about a different roast? Something that smells a little better? A different, different. How about roast beef? I'll take roast beef. I don't want any coffee. I don't want it roasted, fried. Uh, baked, pickled, canned, oh, oh. whatever the case. But anyway, uh, you remember all the folks, the people, the cult of Cornette, they remember Bertie Sanders, the last few springs, this cute little bird. And, and I know the odds are against it being the same bird, but it looks the same and it acts the same. So I call him by the same name. Past few springs. How does he act? Well, he act, I, I'll, I'm about to tell you if you'd quit interrupting me. Don't make me change my tone now. Um, <laughs> he comes in every spring when I, because I open the garage door in good weather. I'm always taking Harley in and out that way. I never leave the house. The garage door stays open during the day. And I will notice that Birdie will show up in the spring and will start trying to build a nest somewhere in the garage. And last year, he even had this past spring, he had a, a an assistant with him. And I would sit there and watch. I try to discourage it because I don't want to. Then if the if the poor little things are living inside the garage, then when I do close the door at night or if I happen to leave or whatever, then, you know, they're, they're trapped and I don't want them to be inconvenienced. But at the same time, when they've started working on the nest, it's su it's such intricate work. And it's so fascinating to watch these birds build a nest. And they're, they're so industrious. And I hate to, I can't bring myself to, to destroy their work and take the nest out once that they've, you know, got the foundation and their framing and everything. So there's still a couple bird's nests in the garage that I just, I don't have the heart to mess with. But anyway, it's been so cold this week, apparently, unseasonably, that Birdie was confused. And so I go out Thursday morning. Uh, out into the garage before I've opened the door, and Birdie's already inside. He's been in since the previous night. Oh, Birdie, come on. Oh, so I open the door, and then I go around the back to talk to my contractors and cleaning some stuff up, and I'm waiting on another television crew because I'm all over the, the TV these days. And they get here, and they were invited. Birdie was unannounced. He was a pop-in or a fly-in, if you would. So... The, the crew gets here, and, and, and then we start loading the stuff, you know, up into the office, do the shoot. And, and then I go downstairs in Stacy's bathroom that she has decorated for herself, which is why I use my office bathroom for all of my serious business, all of my morning Russos and things like that. But I go in there to change clothes and, you know, spruce up for the camera, and I hear, and I'm like, what? They must be carrying that stuff up the stairs, bang the wall. And then I, I hear, <laughs> and a, what the fuck? I look around and there is Birdie upstairs in the second floor bathroom sitting on the daggum curtain rod. 
when they've left the door open carrying the stuff, Birdie has decided to move all the way in to where he is not satisfied with the garage. He wants a programmable thermostat for his climate control. He's all the way in the house. And now I'm thinking, ah, have you ever had, when's the last time you had a bird in the house? Certainly that's happened to you. Yeah, certainly it has. It's, it hasn't happened here. It didn't happen at the last house, but it must've happened somewhere. Cause I remember it happening. But the devil's lettuce. I mean, I don't know. The devil's lettuce. Well, that's the thing. And you know, and we've we've heard the raccoon story here, but we also did have a squirrel somehow get down the chimney one winter. But this was like forty years ago or whatever, and that was exciting. And then we've had the mice come in, but we plugged all those entrances. So this is the first bird that we've actually had. In, and I'm thinking, I've got the bathroom door closed. But now here's the house. How, how am I going to get him out of here? You can't catch a bird barehanded. And I don't want to hurt the poor little thing. And I'm thinking, how am I going to get him out that door, down the stairs, through the kitchen, through the TV room, back out the way whence he came? Well, that's not going to work. And then he could get loose somewhere else. We'll never get this bird. So there's a bathroom window, but it's got a screen on the outside. It's not the screen that that just lifts up and down. It has to come out. And I've got the window up, and Birdie now is buzzing my head, and I'm standing in the bathtub to, to reach the window, and I'm trying, and I just get the screen out, and I say, fuck it, and I just drop it down to the porch on the ground floor below. And I duck down, and he goes, Birdie, Birdie. And Birdie finally flies out the window, and I shut the window real quick. So I didn't mean to hurt Birdie's feelings, but it, it caught me off guard. So I started Thursday morning with a bird in the house. A bird in the house is worth two in the neighbor's house, though, is what I've heard. Did you know I saw on the news they had to herd 11 cows off of the golf course over in Cherokee Park here in Louisville the other day? Were they all from the same vicinity? <laughs> <laughs> say, you were gonna say from the same family what were you gonna say? i was gonna say facility and then i changed it to vicinity <laughs> <laughs> uh, no they were right they were from the they were from the same truck at first they didn't know uh somebody just discovered early in the morning uh 10 or 11 cows wandering around the golf course over at cherokee park and and, and the first news report was we're not sure how they got here but then i heard a later one that a truck had hit a pole over on the interstate and something happened where the cows said well fuck it if you're gonna risk our lives we'll walk rather than ride with you motherfucker and they were cutting through cherokee park i guess on the way to the the cattle producing location and they uh they had to be herded off the golf course and into a i understand they were in a very bad mood when they were awful evacuated from the golf course we, we, you know what 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 i was gonna say because i don't know if we talked about it on the air you remember a few months back we had an issue where all of a sudden the whole neighborhood got an email about a loose cow that a cow from like three towns over had escaped the owner was just waiting for someone to find it and bring it back to him he was not going to do anything and the email was please watch out for bessie make sure the coyotes and the bears don't get her. Like, what the fuck? She's down by the creek, which was the revelation that we had a creek. I had no idea. Well, you know, the owner, doesn't he care for poor Bessie anymore? That was the thing that got everyone. It was like, okay, we found your cow. He's like, okay, well, bring it back. Well, we're not bringing back your cow. All right, I'm going to wait till the town brings it back. <laughs> and uh, apparently he got his wish. Or... You know, Bessie ate it. I really don't know, to be honest. Where, what, what kind of neighborhood are you living in? People have livestock. Is there, are they also running vegetable gardens and they're living off the fat of the land up there? We do have a lot of farms. And one of the uh, towns over here, to something you've always joked about, it's true. I think there are more horses than people actually in the town. That sounds like a friendly town. It's great. I'd like to move into a town. I wonder if there's a. You'd like to move in? I would like to move in. I wonder if there's a peopleless town in America. If there's just a town with no people, but just dogs and squirrels and horses and cows and birds. And if you had that, let's say you really had this perfect Jim Cornette lifestyle. 
ideally, how far outside of a town are you in case you need something? Well, see, that's the drawback. That's the drawback is you don't want to be just out, you know, uh, uh, the directions to your house are turn off the paved road and go seven miles, you know, down the gravel or whatever, because then it's goddamn if you need Twinkies, well, it's just impossible. So the, I used to have a pretty good setup here. Now the problem is people have found my road and determined that since there's no stoplights or no stop signs or didn't used to be any traffic, they can just cut through and get to the interstate ramp uh, better than they can the 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 normal way. Uh, but otherwise, I had it pretty good where I'm a couple miles from any type of business, but then, boom, there's everything. And I'm hidden back here. So it's a couple of miles. back as I used to be. So two miles. That's as much distance as you require. Well, it just depends. Well, no, it depends on the layout of the thing. But you need to be a couple of miles away from everything so you got your breathing room, but you don't want to have to drive 15 miles to mail a goddamn letter. How far outside of town was the Bat Cave? Wayne Manor was a really that nice was estate. You saw, you saw the, the sign, right? It, what was it? What did it? God damn it. What How many it? miles was it? John Fell's going to fucking blister us both now. Was it Gotham City? Was it 16 miles or 12 miles? Okay. I don't, I don't know. Something don't like that. But that was back in the 60s when, you know, you could... Well, remember the old Lucy and Desi comedy hour? They they moved out of New York when Ricky got successful, and they moved up to a the country in Connecticut, and they were living like fucking closer to New York than I did when I was there. But it was like they were they had a farm with cows and chickens and pigs and and all of the rural bullshit that went on. It used to be nice up there, apparently, before I got there. Well, there's still plenty of nice. Then I places. moved up there. There goes the neighborhood. Well, you moved into the worst parts of. Connecticut, to be fair, and well, I'm not no, a Connecticut he, fan. Even on the Dick Van Dyke show, when when Rob would 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 take the train into into the city to go to work, but then he'd be back in lovely New Rochelle, and it looked so serene and peaceful. What does New Rochelle look like these days? Well, it's a little more developed nowadays, but like Greenwich yeah. still has plenty of farms. Whenever I go there, there's farms everywhere. Well, shit, yeah, and find a goddamn real working farm up there. All of them are, are titled farm, this kind of farm and that kind of farm, and they cost $18 million, and they haven't seen a cow up there in 50 years. It's all a bunch of fucking millionaires wouldn't know how to grow an ear of corn if it hit them in the face. Those cows are fucked. I'm telling you, we need to, we need to do something to support the cows up there. Support the cows. You sing a song about killing the cow. You say the cow must die. Well, but we don't want to mistreat them beforehand. <laughs> Make them live in a bad neighborhood. What's the preferred method of death for the cows that you eat? I think it should be a, a nice tranquilizer. Just give them a, an injection and they go to sleep. So you wouldn't want old age just because of what? Disease? Well, do you really want to eat? A f How old is old age for a cow? How long does a cow live? Google, is it legal to fuck a cow in Canada? I'm not Googling that. I'm not well, Googling you wouldn't that. Google sheep fucking in Japan. I thought if it was more How domestic, you'd go. How long does a cow live? How long does a cow? Because <laughs> I'm thinking I don't want to be chewing on a fucking 65-year-old cow. Cows can live for over 20 years, but on commercial farms... The age at slaughter varies considerably. See, now they shouldn't say slaughter. Farms with they should say processing. Farms with poor management, high-yielding cattle or high disease rates will slaughter their animals at a much younger age. Process. Normally after four lactations, around five or six what? years old. That's what it says here. But sometimes after two or three. So they can live to be over 20, but the ones you eat are typically... If it's a good place, I guess between five and six years old, or or, I, or two and three, I really don't know what a good cow is to be quite. But honest now, with you. what's what's the what's the rule? Like a dog year is like seven human years, right? So what's a cow year? Uh, the the productive lifespan of an average cow is between two and a half and four years in most developed dairy industries. Cow calves for the first time at two years of age. 
Uh, the expectancy is 20 years. That, it doesn't say. No, that. but it doesn't say like, but if you're, if your pet cow lives to be 20, it's like 60 in human years or whatever. Or eight, maybe it's 80. Yeah, if a person lives to be 80, cow lives to be 20. Four, so a cow year is four years as opposed to a human year. So if you're eating, thankfully, if you're eating a five-year-old cow, you, then they're 20. I don't want to be eating any minors. There could be some kind of law against that. Should these cows have to show their fucking IDs? Okay, I have a list here, apparently, of uh, one human year is equal to what for different animals. Okay, well, there we go. Uh, hold on, I'm pulling this up right now. See, I just pulled four <laughs> out of my ass, so if... Well, know. it's in alphabetical order, so an ass is 1.78 years old to every one year a human is. A bear is 2 to 1. A cat is 3.2 to 1. A chicken is just over 5 compared to 1 human year. A cow, 3.64. Oh, so almost 4. I was pretty close. How come the cats get better than dogs? Deer, 2.29. Oh. Let's see. Well, no, well, that means they would live longer, right? Yeah. How long do you think a rat is? How many rat? You, how many human year? Well, what the fuck am I saying? How many rats? Rats don't live long. Well, how rats many rats only live what three or four years, right? For every one year of a life, it's equal to twenty six point six seven years. Yes, because they don't they don't get long. There you go. Any other animals except the except the human ones? They last forever. Any other animals you're interested in? Well, dog is seven, right? Is that that's the uh, that's the old wives tale I've been told. Maybe it is a wives tale. According to this, it's 3.64. What? Uh, let me click on this and see what happens. Dog age and cow year. No, I don't want dog and cow year. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. Hey, you've been giving us wrong information this whole time. Maybe I have this. Apparently you can calculate the age of one animal to another. So I could say one kangaroo year is equal to... One kangaroo year is equal to 0.82 pigeon years, for instance. All right. Dog age and cow years, and this is, oh, this was human age and cow years. <laughs> if I click dog, yeah, 3.64. What, what would you do, what would you get if you crossbreeded a dog with a cow? Would you get a cog or a dow? And 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 what characteristics of each would would you be, that would you be able to milk a dog? Tony Khan. Oh, stop this it! Next project. Stop is it! Gonna be is going to be funding biological research to crossbreed cows and dogs so that he can milk his dog. All right, enough of that. Red Rocket. Red Rocket. All right. Unnecessary. There are hundreds of action figures in the mail this weekend. I'll have you find folks know. The feather bottoms have been busy with all of their hands that they still possess, and even more are coming out the middle of this week, and we expect, me and all the minions at Cornette's Collectibles, expect to be caught up with the action figure Armageddon in the next three to four weeks. So we're going to get it in, in in just about eight weeks, which for 2,000 figures or and counting, signed and boxed, uh, is not going to be a bad thing. But if you have uh, an order outstanding at jimcornette.com at Cornette's Collectibles for an action figure, we are processing as fast as our little fingers will allow us to. And there's no waiting, as we've mentioned, on T-shirts and other items because of the Feather Bottoms speedy uh, sorting system or as opposed to the Featherbottom's ultra-careful handling system, or fucks. So anyway, jimcornette.com. And we should mention, Tales from the Territories this week will be on Florida, Vice TV Tuesday at 10 p.m. with uh, Gerald Briscoe, Steve Kern, Kevin Sullivan, a few more folks on that roundtable. I, I love Gerald Briscoe and any story he tells. Uh, so that'll be Tales from the Territories this week. Fear not, Cornet fans, I'm coming soon. 
because uh, there's still, uh, what is it now, seven more episodes to air in this season of Tales from the Territories. And I'm trying to find my paperwork, Brian. My chapped lips are getting in the way. Uh, we've got a couple of emails, and I wanted to share these with everybody. And and uh, one from Thomas. Uh, Hello, Jim and Brian. While And this actually kind of ties into what we were just talking about. Hello, Jim and Brian. While sitting up with my 18-year-old Terrier Mix lady on what will be our last night together, your latest experience episode is giving me some much-needed laughs. Just over two months ago, I had to say goodbye to my 17-year-old Diesel, and hearing you repeatedly give your condolences to other cult members for the loss of their beloved pets has been a source of comfort. Both Lady and Diesel lived long, healthy lives that went by way too fast. They argued and bickered like any other siblings, but never failed to join forces to warn the household of trespassing cats and other random dangers that only they could detect. Anyway, I apologize for rambling, but wanted to thank you guys for bringing laughs during sad times. And um, and we're obviously sorry, but 18 and 17, that's long lives for dogs. You can tell they were well taken care of. I'm, I'm trying to figure out some way to get uh, some illegal dog fountain of youth on the black market for Harley when, when the time comes she's going to need it. She's still a spry little eight. She's still younger than I am even at seven years to one. Unless you're comparing me to a cow, Brian. I was going to say, Thomas, think about how many wonderful years you had in cow years with your dogs. Well, that actually had... I, I, I don't know how you did that math. Anyway, um, Aaron. Aaron from Queens. Uh, just reaching out to let you guys know how much your podcast means to me, especially right now. My father, a proud cult member, suffered a cardiac event last night, and this was this was just a few days ago. I've been looking through em emails here recently. This is his second heart attack since 2019. Uh, my father and I are very close. We speak on the phone almost daily, and this has been very hard for me. The only time I've been able to calm down in the last 24 hours is when I'm able to listen to the drive through or experience while waiting for updates. The comfort of hearing you and Brian discuss the preposterous booking of modern wrestling brings me solace during a real rough time. And I know that when my dad walks out of the hospital, the first thing he'll ask for is a great corny rant to lift his spirits. Um, Aaron, let us know uh, when he walks out of the hospital and we will cut a promo on him for... Face to face, all this we're going to get Jim the Queens, and he's going to do this hey. for your dad right for him. Tell your dad to get up and get out of that hospital, and Jim will be there. Don't lie to this poor man. When he finds out I'm not going to be there, he might have another heart attack. And then you'll give him a rant. But the shock, for heaven's sake. Of the, can you imagine being promised an audience in person with me and then having that taken away? That would pull the rug out from under your whole life, wouldn't it? No, you just have to do it. It'll be your first like make a wish. I I I'm sorry. I'm I'm not legally allowed to enter the city limits of Queens. What? That cannot possibly be true. Well, I can fi I can figure out a goddamn backstory here in a couple minutes to make it sound plausible if you'd give me just a minute. But I have another email. I'm fairly certain I know several people I can call to get you around that. But okay, go ahead. Ah, uh, anyway, this is from Jesse and um. Hey, Jim and Brian, he says, you're receiving this email from someone who's cross-faded. Parenthetically, he says, a mix of drunk and stoned at the same time. Actually, he said, mix of drunk and stoned at the same time's time. Which kind of makes sense. <laughs> Yet I wanted to take the time. <laughs> Quit it now. Yet I wanted to take the time to thank you guys for putting out your podcast because they've helped me through some of the darkest periods of my life including my dad passing away a couple of years ago, as well as help me sleep. It feels alien to me when there's a night that I don't listen to one of the podcasts. Thanks again for helping me out with more bullshit than I would have been able to handle on my own. And now one thing, if we put you to sleep, I'm not sure that's a full-throated endorsement of the program, but maybe because we help you laugh, you get tired out by laughing because we're so entertaining and then go to sleep. I think it's an endorsement, you know, maybe it's, I don't know if you ever did it, but up here, especially- I've sport, done it once or twice, 
Why do you ask? I thought we were talking about this guy. Yet to be proven. But what I was going to say is up here where we have sports radio, you know, my dad did, I did. You go to sleep listening to sports radio. You go to sleep listening to your favorite show and a podcast is better than radio because you're choosing to listen to it. You're choosing what you want to hear. So people are putting it on and going to sleep to it. Well, I can ad- I identify with that. I, I go to sleep to me TV. The sounds of Alfred Hitchcock or the theme from Mannix or... Or if you stay up late enough, Canon, which I watched last night. <laughs> there you go. With William Conrad. Boy, that show looks like shit. You look at Mannix. Mannix looks beautiful on screen nowadays. Canon looks like it was shot on a grainy fucking camera. It looks horrible. A grainy camera or grainy film? A grainy film. Or maybe See, with a grainy they, camera. Yeah. Maybe there's with a grainy, grainy lens. Ca- Maybe there was just sand everywhere. Anyway, the point I was trying to make when we were wishing Jesse well before you Jesse spouted off with your goddamn cannon bullshit <laughs> is, uh, well, no, but if you need to listen to something to fall asleep or you need to listen to something to take your mind off your trouble, then yes, that's appropriate and we are more than happy to help, but... It may be that sometimes you're laying awake and you you don't want to li- just listen to something. You want to talk to somebody. And that is a natural segue, ladies and gentlemen, Brian, take notes, to our sponsors, BetterHelp. Because are you sitting up at night not listening to a podcast for entertainment, but are you sitting up at night listening to yourself dwell on all your problems and or what's going on? And are you dwelling on your problems instead of the solutions to those problems? Do you need a sounding board, somebody to talk to, to make some suggestions, or just to listen? If that's the case, then the folks at BetterHelp can help you. They can train you or help you, teach you to become a better problem solver and make it easier to accomplish your goals. So if you are thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is convenient, it's accessible, affordable, and entirely online. You don't have to be anywhere in person. That's a positive for me in any field of endeavor. And you can get matched with a therapist after filling out a short survey. You can switch therapists at any time. You can connect quickly and easily on the internet, etc. So go to betterhelp.com slash JCE. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. BetterHelp.com slash JCE. You can get 10% off your first month's services. BetterHelp.com slash JCE. And you can still listen to our shows because we will cheer you. We're probably funnier than the therapist. But maybe sometimes you need to be talked directly to. You need a good talking to, Brian. You do, I know. But if you want to talk to somebody directly, BetterHelp is out there. Or you can just get the Minor help that we give you. That's right. Go watch Canon at three in the morning. <laughs> so speaking of getting help for somebody, apparently our old friend Uncle Dave needs a fact checker. Because apparently now there is some amusement in the world of wrestling that Dave fell for I was at a, it wasn't a joke tweet or a rib tweet. It was just a silly tweet that most people obviously would roll their eyes at. And Dave has reported he's finally cracked. He's apparently started the rumor, as I said, off of Twitter, Brian, and you can fill us in somewhat if you've looked this up, that the WWE is intending to or has somehow an agreement in the works to work with garbage championship wrestling. Is this, is this what Dave's doing in his spare time now, spreading rumors? Indeed, in this week's Observer, under the GCW section, usually, if, for those who have never seen like a print Observer or read the Observer, each promotion has a section after the main stories. The only story in this section stated... This promotion has something going on with WWE. Since Jelly Nutella not only was plugging for people to watch Raw, and also told everyone on the roster to do the same and promote Raw this week. And what made a lot of people laugh, and several people got in touch with me, people in the business, and said they were embarrassed that Dave ran with this, 
it was a joke. It was apparently a series of joke <laughs> tweets that he didn't ask anyone if there was any truth to, seemingly. Because basically what's happened to Dave is whatever's happened to his mind as he's aged has also completely robbed his sense of humor. And he didn't realize they were yanking people's chain because didn't the tw the original tweet was like a a mark picture of Stephanie McMahon standing next to the owner operator and manipulator of garbage championship wrestling he looks like the alter ego of underdog the humble and lovable shoeshine boy and he's taken a mark picture <laughs> With Stephanie McMahon, who's probably thinking, God, is, is COVID still a thing with this guy so close to me? And they tweeted that out as as like, you know, yeah, we're going to be working together. And oh, stay tuned. Big things coming. And they've been joking about it apparently for a while because the photo went around and some people made fun of it. And then they, and it's smart. You capitalize on it. You own the joke. And you just keep <laughs> the joke going. And apparently some people don't see the joke. Or at least don't call anyone and go, hey, is this a joke or is this, <laughs> is this real crazy thing happening? And in, in other news, the Monroe brothers will be renovating Vince's mansion in Greenwich now that he has time in his retirement to address some of the work that needs to be done up there. I uh, would like to announce, uh, and just please don't check on this or confirm it, that I'm the new chief brand officer of AEW. And in fact, <laughs> Tony Khan is really Charlie from Starkville, Mississippi. But wait, if you're the new chief brand officer, does that mean that you get to ride on the bus with Cody? No, I get the bus. It's now my bus. Oh, because there's going to be a settlement. Yes, and that's going to be my reality show where I repossess the bus from the Rhodes family, kicking and screaming, and then I take it back on the road, and uh, I don't know what we do with it from that point forward. Speaking of, since you brought it up, and the bus, and the Rhodes family, and... and <laughs> what did I bring up? <laughs> well, people working together, and et cetera. Have you seen this, where... The AEW fans are just applauding and just over the moon because one of the new uppity up big wigs, the head honchos, some lady, can't remember her name, in Warner Brother Discovery conglomerate company, said, oh yeah, AEW does good ratings for us, so what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to develop some other programming with AEW that doesn't take place in a ring. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the first step to we want a relationship like USA Network has with their wrestling show. We want to submit ideas to you. That's the next step. Well, besides that, they haven't figured this out either. They have not, just like shit stain, couldn't ever figure it out. People that don't want to watch wrestling are not going to watch wrestlers do other shit besides wrestling. And people who don't want to watch wrestling are not going to watch a wrestling show just because you're doing stupid and or comedic and or outside of wrestling shit that, that the wrestling fans doesn't like. I used to hear this all the time from shit state. Well, the wrestling fans, they're going to watch the show regardless. They're already watching. They're not going anywhere. So we can just do all this other stupid shit to get other people to watch. Well, what happened? The wrestling got so fucking bad that a bunch of people decided, yeah, we're going to quit watching it. Millions over the last 20 years since this whole thing started. And they have not yet realized that besides the fact that people who don't like wrestling aren't going to watch a wrestling program just because there's entertaining shit on the wrestling program, but people who like wrestling are not going to watch wrestlers goddamn cook in the kitchen. The, the most devoted people will watch anything, but seriously, they have a, a program that produces ratings for them. So they want to take people on that program and have them do completely different shit than they do on that program, and they think people will watch that. And again, yeah, there's going to be some people that's going to watch any fucking thing. But they ought to try to start fixing their fucking wrestling program and making more fans of that, and then they might have a better chance. Because, again, we, we went through this when did... Because Daniel Cormier 
was the special guest referee at the uh, fight pit match, does that mean that every UFC fan and re every MMA fan decided to watch that one wrestling show because he was on it doing something other than what they like to watch him do? Or... It, it, but who's your problem with? Because... But the the Logan Paul thing. Yes, Logan Paul gets a lot of attention and a lot of publicity, and he's been very good at wrestling. But do all of Logan Paul's fans from his YouTube channel, do they all suddenly flock to see him involved in wrestling? Not really, because elsewise, they'd do 5 million more viewers whenever the goddamn guy showed up on TV, wouldn't they? Yeah, and it would be an interesting study if you take any proven drawing card across any combat sport or anything like this and see how many people buy an event versus how many social media followers they have so you could try to figure out what the actual conversion rate is. It's probably incredibly small. It has to be incredibly small for any of these people that have a lot of followers. I asked you before, who do you have a problem with? Do you have a problem with the network for saying they want this or do you have a problem with Tony for saying, okay, I mean, if the network's asking for this, I need a good relationship yeah. with the network. I got to yes, kind of give them what they want. But... It's the problem is what they want. They don't understand wrestling or wrestling fans. What was the ratings for Roads to the Top? At the time, they were doing half to a third of the number of people watching AEW when Cody was actually on the AEW show, right? So yes, there's some interest, but there's n it's not going to do the ratings of another wrestling program. And then imagine if the wrestling program they were already doing was good. They need to make more fans for their fucking program instead of worrying about it. Again, I just hear this from, I heard it in the WWE. You hear it from every television network. Yeah, we want to take the people on this program and then put them in something else that's not anything similar to the program that people are watching. We think people will watch that. But is Tony stuck? Is Tony in a position where he has to say yes? Well, probably, but again, that's the, you know, television networks owning or operating or manipulating wrestling. Let's get all the fucking wrestlers on this program and get them to do anything else. But that's the, you know, <sighs> it is interesting I, too, because you have reality shows that are wrestler based, like the diva shows and the Miz and Mrs. And whatever numbers those do. And I think the Bellas one did pretty good for E. But there's never been any sign that there was a conversion of that audience to a pay-per-view buyer, whatever that means. So someone who's going to go subscribe to Peacock to see the Bellas wrestle, using them as an example. And that's wrestler-based reality content. Well, and just remember Ali Inoki, because the concept was, my God, all the boxing fans will want to see it. And Ali was the biggest athlete in the world. And then obviously Inoki in Japan, which they did. Everybody in Japan wanted to see, you know, it, it did monster television ratings. What, like two thirds of the country in Japan saw it on television. Here, nobody gave a shit because nobody knew who Inoki was. And the boxing fans didn't want to see Ali not box. So it flopped. Um. I'm just saying that's the business has much bigger problems than whether or not we can develop a reality show starring Darby Allen or whatever the fuck, where every week he tries to figure out a, another way to break his fucking neck and hospitalize himself for free. And a third or whatever percentage of the people already watching AEW is going to watch that. And Meanwhile, the people watching actual wrestling programs continues overall to shrink because even if WWE's kind of hanging in there steady, you know, the the AEW program is constricting because they're, you know, they're they've lost their stars. And we'll talk about one of them in a second, but they've lost their stars and everybody's hurt and the booking is a shambles and the fringe people that were watching it for the points in time where it would 
impersonate a mainstream wrestling program when they'd have a punk or a Danielson and something big, they're dropping out because there's no more punk and Danielson's buried. MJF is a highlight, but what else are we looking forward to these days? So that's the problem with AEW right now. Ratings wise, there's nothing that holds people. People will tune in to see what's there. And depending on what's there, they'll either tune out fast, which I think was what happened this week. Again, it's a different night because you had all the, uh, it was, it was a Tuesday, and you also had a lot of competition, but you also started with the best friends, and people weren't like, hey, let's check this out. They were there at the start, and then they jumped off the ship. And, you know, so anyway, I wish them well with all their reality shows where all of the indie-minded outlaw wrestlers that want to be TV stars and can't even fucking produce in a wrestling program yet will get to live out their fantasies that people actually give a shit what they do in their spare time. But let's talk about the big news of the week. Apparently now the, the information has trickled out or dripped out or trickled down and dripped or whatever the case that Punk and AEW are negotiating, potentially, we this has not been confirmed, we haven't seen documentation of this, but that's the story going around, Punk and AEW are working on a contract buyout, and that the holdup is a non-compete clause. So, <laughs> the one good thing that has happened to this company over the last year, they get a major star. He produces ratings. He produces gates. He produces good television. He produces good matches. And Tony Khan cannot keep his fucking nursery school from fucking up this goddamn deal and pissing off his star. And now, instead of telling Twinkle Toes and the Cucamonga kids, hey, why don't y'all go back and play with your fucking schoolgirl friends in Japan because I need real talent because I'm in a promotional war and my ship is taking on water. Now he's going to talk about to punk about a buyout. Does that mean he's going to bring the other three back? Or will he buy punk out and just fire the other three for putting him in this position to spend probably a few million dollars at minimum? to never have his biggest star on his television again. Your thoughts before I get too pissed off. I mean, it's very sad that this is the ending and this is where we've come to. We'll talk about the non-compete because that's the very interesting aspect of this because no one has really thought about the idea of CM Punk going to WWE until all this has popped up. Uh -huh. I will say it's almost... Poetic. It's almost as if it was scripted perfectly. CM Punk debuts in Chicago with the first dance. Same building that Michael Jordan had the last dance in. And they just had that ESPN documentary series, The Last Dance. CM Punk has, in my eyes, and everyone has their own opinion and their own thoughts, has almost a perfect year. His feuds, his promos, his matches, even the ones I wasn't crazy about, they told a story. Nothing was phoned in. And we had one amazing year. And he went out in the same place he had the first dance. He had his last dance. And what better way to script the ending? Wins the world championship. Knocks out the troublemakers in the back. Now he's going to get fired for it. I mean, the problem is it was set in stone in a way. Because the only way he was... The only way this was going to work is if Tony decided he was going to take charge and put his foot down. But Tony had, you know, Tony had Mega who wanted CM Punk fired. And Jericho wants CM Punk fired. So who that talks to Tony is going to bat for CM Punk? Nobody. So now it's Tony's thoughts versus all these people saying, fire Punk. You know, it's sad. I hope this isn't the last we see of CM Punk. That's my other thing. I, as a wrestling fan, I tremendously enjoyed his last year. Like I said, everything. It brought a sense of realism to that program. And people reacted to it. So it's not just me saying it. Other people felt it too. I just hope this isn't the last we see of him. And uh, 
If this is the last of him in AEW, if all this is true, it was the best run anyone's had in AEW. Hey, you know, that is actually perfect because you were right about everything you said. He came in, he produced in every metric, television ratings, gate, pay-per-view, match quality, promos, everything. The only person in the three years of this television program, everything he did pretty much made sense, except for the shit that he had to coexist with. And then he basically, on his last night, wins a world title and, and beats his shit. And A. Steel, along with him, beats the shit out of the fucking guys running their fucking pie holes behind his back and tells the public what he thinks of them. But it should have ended up with those three being exiled and Punk after his injury. And here's another thing that I don't even think we've said this. Maybe somebody else has brought it up. He had to know that he had torn his, what did they say, torn a tricep or tricep. whatever the injury was. Okay, he had to know that that was in some way damaged. And do you think he's sitting there at fucking midnight or whatever it was in Chicago going, all right, I've put up with these motherfuckers. I have tried to talk to them and I've tried to talk to Tony about it. I've done this business for these people. I've brought these eyeballs on, on this company for these people. I've put up with these children. And now I'm fucking probably hurt. And I'm tired. And I'm old. And I work with children. And you know what? I might not get the chance to say some of these things in public again that need to be said. So here we go. Give me some muffins. It makes sense now. because. The one thing that you can say about Punk and the one thing that I admire about him is he doesn't take bullshit. He will tell you you're full of shit. And he did. He told the whole world who was full of shit because he couldn't get it rectified any other way. So now the problem is Tony has allowed his lack of leadership and the people he's chosen to do business with who are all as we've mentioned, mortified that real talent came in the company and showed them up and outdrew them and outperformed them. And they couldn't take it. And they wanted to get him out of the way. And now if Tony does buy this contract out and Punk doesn't come back, but the other jackoffs do, then we will see again that he doesn't want this business to get bigger. He wants to play with his action figures and promote indie-rific, outlaw-style wrestling because that's what he likes and that's what all of his friends want to do. And he'll pay them as much money as they need to, to have for to be happy to do that for him. On the other hand, we will have an amazing passive-aggressive war between the Jericho side and the fucking elite side. And we haven't <laughs> had that yet. And that'll be coming up. You know, the, the, the locker room angles are more entertaining than what's on television. I wish they'd just feed the security camera to TBS. But here's the, about the non-compete. Right now, I would, I would have said at any point in time, no, Punk doesn't want to go back to the WWE. Punk doesn't have to go back to the WWE. He's still got his fuck you money. He's going to get bought out for a lot of money if that happens here, or else, or else if he comes back, he'd get paid a lot of money. Nobody's going to be doing any fucking GoFundMes. But now would be the perfect time for Triple H to show the world that he will put business in front of personal feelings. Because, again, one of the greatest lines in the history of wrestling that was never uttered on television was what Punk said to Triple H in the locker room. I don't need to work with you. You need to work with me. But that's not, I hate you and your family and I hope Stephanie gets run over by a herd of thundering goats or whatever. Although there may have to be some apologies for firing him on his wedding day. That, that may, be, well, one, I would, no, that may no. be one they have to apologize for. <laughs> but no, see, here's the thing. There's no real apologies that Triple H needs to ask for. He needs to offer some. And I would imagine... That's what I'm saying. They fired yeah. CM Punk on his wedding day. He needs to offer yeah. some apologies. But who was in charge? Vince McMahon. 
And eight years later, whatever it is, now, depending on what this non-compete clause is, Triple H can go to the, and say to the world and say to CM Punk, it's all changed. We're about business. Let's get together. It's all about business. No personal feelings. And have you met Nick Khan? Have you met Nick Khan, one of the slickest guys in the world? And here's several million dollars. And then they've got the goddamn top talent that AEW has had on their television over the past three years on their TV. And, and Cody. That he, and, <laughs> and, well, and, and, and Cody. One of the EVPs, yeah. the top in-ring star, depend on what happens in 2024, maybe MJF, who knows. Uh, but it would make a statement to everybody else in the business, in the locker rooms, They'll make up with anybody and they got money to spend because they're serious and it's a new regime. And so now, again, they would make Tony look like an idiot at a point where his whole company has already made him look like an idiot multiple times. <clears throat> and even if it's six months from now or whenever he gets finished with his surgery. So that's probably what the holdup is. Tony Khan said, well, if I'm going to pay you, then you shouldn't be able to go anywhere for however long your contract was for, well, maybe I'll just sue you for your EVPs busting in my locker room and causing a goddamn fiasco. So we'll see how it plays out. If you're Tony, are you demanding a non-disclosure agreement? Jesus Christ, we know that Tony sleeps with those under his pillow. Right, but that doesn't mean you have to agree to it. Yeah, are are you are you buying my contract back or are you buying my silence? To those prices may be different. I hope he doesn't sign an NDA. Well, everybody's going to know what happened, yeah. just not how much. Nobody needs to know how much, but everybody's going to know what happened. And now, again, if you are a serious talent in the wrestling industry, if you're not just a young rookie that has no other chance but to get on television or to make any kind of money, or if you're not an old veteran that just wants to coast and laugh at the goofs that you're, you're sitting looking at and get a bunch of money from a billionaire, there's no reason to go to AEW. If you're a serious talent that will outdraw and outperform the EVPs and their friends, or if you're not in their clique and you're not in their social circle, and they don't like you, well, then you're fucked because the boss is not in charge. So it doesn't matter whether the boss signs you to a contract or not. Then you're putting your career in the hands of Matt and Nick Jackson. I understand sit in according to what I've been reading on Twitter or on the internet, sit in on the production and booking meetings, twinkle toes when he's there, sits in. Talk about whistling stranger in paradise. These morons sitting in on a wrestling booking session. So that's who any serious talent would be placing their careers in the hands of. A feckless, ineffectual leader that lets his talent run rampant over him and a bunch of jealous, indie-minded, as you said, passive-aggressive little fucking twats that basically run anybody off that either is not in their friend circle or that can get over them, which is almost everybody in a serious wrestling business. If the Bucks survive this, you think, who do you think comes out on top, them and Jericho, in terms of backstage politics? Well, but now, see, remember, you're still, the Bucks are still dealing then with an old master when it comes to conniving. Um, and Jericho is, you know, he's very, he's very polished with that. So, and, and also we know that he loves coups and insurrections. So <laughs> keep an eye. He could, be, he, could, he could be storming the gates of Daly's place anytime now. Uh, I'm sure Hager will be with him. Hager will be right there alongside of him. So CM Punk, I mean. Here we are. If this really is the end, how do you look at his AEW run? I, I I really couldn't disagree with anything that you said when you ran it down. His matches have all made sense. Somebody's go, oh, but he botched a fucking buckshot lariat or what? Big shit. 
Look at that program. Maybe CM Punk wouldn't have looked so good over the last year if he was on a good television program, but he wasn't. But everything that he did made sense, was serious, didn't insult the wrestling business. It drew money, it drew ratings, it was the promos, the whatever, everything you said. That, if that was something they could have built off of, if Tony was smart enough and if the other people weren't working against him. But because they're so schizophrenic, because they have to have their falderall and their best friends hugging each other and the goddamn lizard man and all that Southern California PWG bullshit that nobody wants to fucking see. And that's why they tune it out by the hundreds of thousands. They were working at cross purposes. If you'd have had a, a young, serious lineup of talent ready to go in some interesting situations underneath guys like punk and danielson when they were both doing ratings then you could afford to lose some of the top guys because people would be more interested in your newer talent now with the exception of mjf who gets himself over again who on the male or female side is more is in a better place now is more over is more popular is more of an asset to the program than when they made their surprise appearance for the first time or when they first showed up. Nobody. You know, before we go anywhere else, I'm going to rant and rave for another couple minutes, and there's people out there in Twitter land that are going to say, oh, yeah, the old man yells at the cloud again. He's so angry and old and behind the times. And, uh, you know, obviously 40 years' experience in doing something doesn't matter to people who know what's going on. But there were even more comments still on Twitter. Remember, I trended because I was a racist because I knocked old Satchel Ass's reckless work. And, yeah. you know, the, the only possible reason for that be because she's black, not because she's about to kill this other girl. And you made me look up that term. and You didn't make me, but I ended up doing it because I'd never heard it before. Snatch you bald-headed, and it's an old North... Uh, not North, but an old New England term <laughs> that was Well, used. how did Mama Cornette get it? She never visited New England. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, but anyway, nevertheless, the point is the root of this thing is there's people out there that tell me and or Road Dog and or Gerald Briscoe and or Mike Mondo and or people who've been doing this for 20 and 30 and 40 in Jerry's case, 60 fucking years. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. They agreed to it. They were working stiff. People, not only do the fans not know what working stiff means anymore, most of the wrestlers don't. They think, I guess, working stiff means reckless and dangerous and being lackluster and frivolous with your opponent's body and or yours. And it comes down, I think, to not only how easy it is to get in the wrestling business these days, but how people are trained. And, you know, we've, we've talked about it's not a joke and it's not a knock. I'm telling the truth because they admit it. A lot of the indie talent did the, the Hardy Boy thing. They became the poster boys for let's get on a trampoline in our backyard and train ourselves. And they forget that then the Hardys once they finished with that, they still fucking had to work with veterans to get ahead once they got in the real wrestling business, and they had to learn things, even though potentially they, you know, well, let's face it, the Hardys are patient zero for a lot of this stuff, but they were the innovators and they got away with it, but now everybody thinks they can do it. But go ahead, what were you going to say? You know, I'm thinking about this as you're talking about it, and I think for a certain style with the Hardys, you're right. But what I was going to ask you, because it kind of predates anyone knowing the Hardys. I mean, they were doing job matches for you on TV tapings for Smoky Mountain, but was it Smoky Mountain where you first started seeing wrestlers that were influenced by the stiff style that they were seeing on videotapes from Japan? Well, no, not really in in the Smoky Mountain area. Beyond the yes, high flying, but, but the actual like the all Japan matches where they were laying stuff in, and even out of the New Japan matches, actually. Yeah, well, and actually, except for when 
when Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers and later on Bobby and Jackie Fulton a couple times would go to Japan, they'd come back and either the Midnight Express or the bodies would be like, Jesus Christ, we get, it's going to take another two weeks to calm them down and get them to start working again. Um, what did Ricky and Robert tell you about when they went to all Japan? God, what year was that? I think it was like 88. I think it was the year they left. When they yeah, see, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't around them then when they came back because they had left Crockett. And, but uh, that must have been a fucking culture shock for both sides. Um, and, and everything's context. But nevertheless, the point is that it's <sighs> the fans are learning on the internet now what they think about wrestling, not from the the era of Gerald Briscoe or the era of me or even the era of a Mike Mondo from 20 years ago in OVW. They're learning from the current indie wrestlers, the self-trained guys or the guys that are trained by people with the same level of experience at the same age. They're all being taught to do moves and that this is show business and Guys think nothing of now if they show up at an indie show. Oh, you're going to work with the Invisible Man. Cool. I'll get to do some fun stuff. That's what's led to what we've got for wrestling these days. And the reason this came up in my mind, and it was a long convoluted thought process, as mine usually are, but I was doing some research on the Graham brothers and I had known this before because I read the book before, but it had slipped my mind that Dr. Jerry Graham was actually trained and broken in the business by Jim Londos because he, Graham was from Phoenix and Londos retired to Phoenix. And that was amazing to me because here, Jerry Graham, who would later on become an innovator and a pioneer in tag team wrestling and wrestling heel psychology and television promos when they were new and all that shit. That's the way that the Graham family dynasty started was trained by a guy who never did television because it what didn't exist when he was the biggest box office traction in wrestling and would have probably from the thirties would have been pretty straight on high spots and everything too. Right. But Jerry Graham became one of the great psychologists in wrestling because he was trained by a guy that had worked with all the best and had been there in the pioneer days when they developed the psychology behind wrestling. And we, every succeeding generation, we lose more of what this business is about, was about, should be about. and going more into this, I don't know, fucking performance art phase that they've got going now that is appealing to fewer people than ever before in the history of wrestling. And you can't say that, well, <clears throat> you know, things evolve and things go out of style and whatever, baseball didn't, football didn't, basketball didn't. Wrestling was bigger than all of those things. And it's the only professional sport that is dovetailed in popularity and in mainstream acceptance. And it's because of the, the way that the current performers think about the business and the fact that I think that it's so easy. Anybody with money to spend can be in a wrestling business now because there's a wrestling school on every corner. Somebody's going to train somebody. If there's outlaw shows you can just walk up on and say, hey, yeah, let me be on it. And so none of the people in the business respect it or had to put in, they're talking about paying their dues because they've got to go work independent shows for $10 or no money or $20 or a hot dog or whatever and take all these bumps. Well, you don't have to take all those fucking bumps. You're just doing it on purpose. You didn't sell any tickets or you wouldn't be making $10. And that, that mindset with these people is why now it's, it's a complete rib. The marks are in the ring. Everybody's destroying their body and the people in the audience are laughing at it. 
Whereas in every previous generation up until what, 25 years ago, the guys in the ring were safe and the people in the seats were screaming because they thought they were all getting killed. Now they get killed and everyone sits on their hands and then they get taken yes. away and everyone will clap, you know, when they stick their thumb and, yeah, well, yeah, and, and when somebody does get knocked out for real, then everybody's all concerned, like, oh gosh, well, why, then why were you chanting, we want tables in a girls match five minutes ago if you didn't want one of those girls to be fucking paralyzed? But see, that's the thing. And training. Yeah, this is the end result of that. That's what I was going to say. It's the end result of the era when people watched a lot of tapes and just wanted to copy things they saw and anyone can open a wrestling school. Yes. And training used to be about how to think about the business and how to react to things. It, you always had a situation where it was made as hard as possible for a guy to get into business. They didn't just open up to everybody. They wanted to make sure people were serious. Yes, it's a little excessive to break Hulk Hogan's ankle in his first workout, but he was serious enough to come back. But everybody got stretched. Here's the thing. The reason why I always liked Tennessee wrestling was because Tennessee was the last territory with a direct link to the pioneers of wrestling. Roy Welch was a wrestler in the 1920s, and he was in charge of the territory until the mid-70s. And then Jerry Jarrett took over, and he was in charge until 1997. Two men had control of a large geographic area of the wrestling business for almost 60 years between the two of them. And the style and the psychology and the lessons that were passed down from the pioneers of this thing were personal issues, draw money, conflict between two guys, make the people believe the animosity is real. It's how you react to things. And, and training used to be when it, advanced training happened in the ring in front of people. Regular training might not even go on in a ring. Ric Flair trained Stan Lane in his backyard. Stan would come down to Charlotte from Greensboro, go to Flair's house. He always had a gym or gym equipment in his house. They'd work out. They'd run, you know, the, the roads in the, in the neighborhood, do road work. And then they'd work on holds and reversals. Same thing happened in barns. Uh, Vern Gagne's barn. Maybe they got in a ring once in a while, but it was, okay, I'll grab you in a headlock. Now you grab my wrists and you turn left and stand up and the veteran would put himself in a top wrist lock. Now I'm going to fucking duck through and reverse it. I got you in a hammer lock. You scream, see? Eh, they'd crank up on it a little bit, let you know what it felt like. You would go through simple, basic holds and reversals and how to take a flat back bump and, and things like that. And then you would actually learn in the ring with a veteran in the opening match somewhere where they would tell you every move to make and put themselves in holds for you. And they would tell you, listen to the people, hear how they react, watch when I do this. And it, even in OVW, when we trained guys, yes, you told them how to do the moves and then taught them how to take bumps safely and here's a high spot, one tackle, drop down, hip toss, kick off, get it again. But you, we spent more, I spent more time with the guys, especially the advanced class, on reactions, the emotion that you showed, the facials, the attitude you had, body language, what is happening to you and how do you react to it naturally? And that's the same thing that the veterans would teach young guys how to think about wrestling. It wasn't a... a you do this move now, and boy, this move, and they'll really pop. It was like, okay, it's too early to beat the baby face. The people will lose faith in him. He's got to win that match, but we'll get some heat afterwards. Or this is the one where the baby face needs to win, or the people will lose faith in him. So he's got to win this match. Some people say wins and losses don't matter. If you're a job guy and you're just there to put people over, no, it doesn't. And if it's a cold match just on the card underneath, probably doesn't. But the most important thing about wrestling 
is wins and losses when you're either pushing somebody to get them over or you're conducting a program. The veterans would teach you that. If you beat the fucking heel now, you'll take his heat away. Or it's not time for a fucking comeback on the baby face of whatever. That was the psychology. And the training was more about protecting the business, respecting the business, how to think about it, and how to logically get yourself over rather than, oh, we're going to do all these moves and it's going to be a four-star match, which, as we all know, didn't exist. And Danny Davis, he was on the program years ago. Here, we, I guess people can look it up. But he started by answering an ad in the Jackson, Tennessee newspaper. If you want to be a wrestler, come to the Jackson Coliseum at 11 o'clock Sunday morning. And there were all kinds of people standing out there in the parking lot. And that was in 1978. That's when Buddy Fuller had started training guys on his farm in Bolivar. And out of like 12 that were picked, Danny Davis was one of two that were left. at. The, he was the smallest guy, and he was one of two that were left at the end of the thing. And the other guy wrestled for a few months. Danny had a 15-year wrestling career and ran his own business for 25 years, and it was the most successful wrestling training program, maybe of all time and certainly of modern times. But the way he learned, he had this nice facility here in Louisville with air conditioning, finally, the last building we got, and a ring and TV lights and all that stuff. He was trained by Buddy Fuller and that Terry Sawyer, who was an amateur shooter, on Buddy's farm in Bolivar, and he paid Buddy in order to do farm work all day and then get stretched in a barn that night because the old-timers would stretch you. And it wasn't float-overs and collegiate wrestling. It was the old carny shit and hooking, as Luthez used to term it, the title of his book, Hooker. Those were the, those were the guys that were more dangerous than the shooters, the hookers. They could rip your shit out without thinking about it. Adrian Street was somewhat of a hooker. I said one time he could grab your dick and beat you over the head with it while he ate dinner with the other hand. And that's what they would do. And the same thing happened to David Schultz. It's in his book. Only it wasn't Buddy Fuller. It was Buddy's uncle, Herb Welch. At his farm in Dyersburg, the Welches always had land out in Dyersburg. Roy Welch had a second house out there in addition to his place in Nashville. As a matter of fact, he had a Second wife out there in Dyersburg, in addition to his wife in Nashville. That's a different story. But they took David Schultz in the fucking barn and stretched him and rubbed the skin off his face and beat on him. And I saw David Schultz as a rookie. And he was still six foot five and 230 pounds easy. And that 60 something year old Herb Welch tortured him to the point where when he'd get home at night, he couldn't get out of his own car and his wife was begging him to quit. But when they persevered, they had a respect for the business. They had It wasn't paying your dues, riding up and down the road, working a outlaw match for $10. It was to get in the business, to learn the secrets. And finally, after Danny had been stretched for several weeks in a row, he's finally he bowed up because Danny's fucking full of piss. And he said, I want to do the shit they do on television. And that's when they put their arm around him and said, okay, here's what goes on. You had to prove that you were serious before you were allowed in the brotherhood and exposed to the secrets. And by that, you learned a respect for what was going on. If you jacked off, said the wrong thing, were frivolous with the information, it affected everybody's income. Everybody was paid on the gates. More tickets sold, more money for everybody. Fewer tickets sold, less money for everybody. If you did something to harm the business, make it look phony or bullshit, the other guys would take care of you because you were taking money out of their fucking mouth and their families. And there was a level, because of all that, of respect for the knowledge you had and the people that had let you into their their deal, this thing of ours, 
and you learned because they knew they had been doing it for years. And, you know, I'm always fascinated by things that I saw in wrestling. And I was like, how did that develop? Was that the first guy that came up with that? I've mentioned this to you before. That thing that Dory and Terry Funk used to do, that nobody else I ever saw do this move, <laughs> where a guy would back up, back him up into the ropes and they would grab the guy and they'd stick their leg in between his legs and they'd jump up on the top rope and they would flip over backwards and throw the guy right over the top, over the, over the top of him. Slick looking move. And then I was watching a tape of the Graham brothers, Jerry and Eddie from Capitol Wrestling in 1958. They're doing the same move. I said, wait, how could the Funks stole it? Well, maybe the Funks worked for Eddie Graham. Then I remembered Eddie Graham, his first major territory, and what put him on top was working Amarillo for Dory Funk Sr. I bet you he learned it from him because he learned a lot of booking from him. And then you go back further when I look at the reference book that Scott Teal did on Amarillo Wrestling. Roy Welch was wrestling in Amarillo in 1930. And at that point in time, the original Dutch Mantel, not today's Dutch, but the original Dutch Mantel that he was named after was the top wrestler in Amarillo. And you read and see that they're doing some of the same kind of angles and the same kind of things that you would have seen in Texas in the 50s or in Florida in the 70s or in Tennessee for a 40-year period. And it's amazing the link that you can draw to the people that started this business that basically by trial and error understood that they had the power to manipulate people's emotions to where they could cause riots or cause celebrations in the streets if they just applied themselves to getting their issue over and drawing the people into it. It wasn't about whacking each other over the head with chairs. It was about making the people come to see you whack each other over the head with chairs because you hate each other so bad or because there's such an important championship on the line or whatever. It was motivating people to buy into what you were doing to get invested in the program, not by hospitalizing yourself by going too far because everybody now knows it's all bullshit. So that's a, each successive generation, it's not only become easier to become involved in the wrestling business, but it's also the standards have been lower as far as what guys are allowed to do once that they get in it. And now they can just do anything they fucking want. Whether it's a preliminary guy stealing a show from the main event guy or whatever the fuck. And that's why it's all just a constant barrage of motion and meaningless scripted chatter. And occasionally somebody can make you slow down and listen like an MJF or a punk because they sound like they mean what they say. But otherwise, we've lost the, the whole meaning of this thing that existed for a hundred plus years in fine form until everybody decided they could do it better about 20 years ago. And the outside forces got involved and said, oh, shit, we need to get other people watching wrestling besides wrestling fans. So we'll make the wrestling program so fucking intolerable for the wrestling fans that all these other people are going to be the only ones watching. And I, one more thing. Remember the the story? Well, it's not a story. It's been, it was a fact. It happened. Mario Galento attacking Jerry Jarrett on Live Memphis TV. It was recounted a couple of weeks ago on Tales from the Territories. It's been a topic of conversation around wrestling in Tennessee for 50 years. And we found out a new detail. Jerry Jarrett said he actually did pull Mario Galento's eyeball out and throw it on the ground, which Didn't that would happen. have been... Well, that would have been difficult because Mario only had one good eye to begin with, and that would have been it at that point in time. So I don't doubt he went for the eye, and they'd already busted him open and et cetera, but the eyeball didn't leave. But the point is, Jerry Jarrett credited a guy named Sailor Moran with teaching him how to shoot and take care of himself. 
And if you go back and look at this Amarillo lineup from 1930, guess who Roy Welch is wrestling? Sailor Moran. That guy was a legitimate motherfucker, too. And he was one of Roy Welch's old cronies. And when Roy took a liking to Jerry Jarrett as a 20-something-year-old kid, he had never even been a wrestler. They broke him in as a referee, but he was booking Memphis before he even became a wrestler. And the old-timers resented him. And so before they put him in the ring, Roy Welch had his old crony, Sailor Moran, teach him, say, hey, these guys are going to fuck with you because of who you are and because, you know, I put you in this position. So here, this guy will teach you all the shit you need to do to take care of yourself in a pinch. And this was in the late 60s. It still went on in the business. And, but, it, 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 you know, that's why the, the old timers, they could never fully let their guard down if they were anybody important because somebody might try to make a name off of them. So they, they knew how to take care of themselves in a pinch with shit that was not necessarily allowed in collegiate competition. But that's where this business came from at the grassroots level, getting a gathering a crowd and convincing them that two guys were mad at each other and there's going to be a fight. And say what you want, technology has changed. Now, instead of in the carnival, they can have it on worldwide pay-per-view. But human emotions have not changed. If they buy into something and they believe in it, they're going to invest more of their time and emotion and effort. And if they think it's all bullshit, they're going to watch it for free or get a giggle out of it and then move on. And that's where we've we have now turned wrestling into something that people watch and get a giggle out of for free and move on. Except for the last vestiges of those 25 million people that used to buy a ticket every year in the 60s and 70s is now down to about 2 million that'll watch television and still can't get over it. But there you have that. Here's, a, here's one more factoid, because somebody put this out on Twitter. Jerry Lawler, who still wrestles occasionally, actually wrestled Lou Thez, who debuted in 1935. And they said, nobody else can make that claim. I got another one for him, Mike Jackson. Mike Jackson from Alabama still wrestles every once in a while at some of these fan fests and, and shows. And he also wrestled Lou Thez when he was a job guy in Tennessee in the early 70s, and Thez was working there. So that's 67 years between two generations. That ain't bad. You know, the Jerry Graham thing, while I'm certain he learned a lot of the respect he had, as zany as he was for wrestling from Jim Londis and a lot of those guys when he came up, I wonder how much of modern wrestling psychology or what was wrestling psychology actually originates with him. Yeah, well, he was... He was a hypnotist. I have photos galore of him doing yes hypnosis on people, like these displays and storefronts and everything. So, I mean, he was obviously beyond wrestling into manipulating people's minds. Well, and he was he was a, you know, lunatic genius, right? In that yeah. he had alcohol issues and he had mental illness. But at the same time, he was one of the pivotal figures in the 50s there that got heat everywhere he went. And thing is, you got to remember, at that time, here he is, he's a hypnotist. He's got to have a, and he, and he was a promo, and he had a, a big personality and great patter, verbal ability. TV interviews are brand new. It, you know, when he first gets his spot in the first main event spot he had in Atlanta in, what, 55, 56? Television is new. It's only been around for six or seven years. And so TV promos were new. And most of the old timers that had never even seen television, much less been on it, they couldn't talk. They'd never had to. They could draw their pictures in the ring. But here comes Jerry Graham, and he's braggadocious, and he's colorful, and whenever he wasn't 400 pounds, he looked good. 
And but he always had a brother to do the work for him. It seems like he got Eddie, then he got Luke. Well, after a certain he, point, you know, yeah, definitely to a certain well, when he got big and heavy. Um, but the mind just he, for yeah, I mean, there would have been no Garden Riot without him. Forget about how much they love Rocca. Forget about the fact Dick the Bruiser was there. It was Jerry yeah. Graham bleeding, well, and causing trouble. <laughs> That's what it was. Well, and also because it there the the story is out there that. You know, Jerry Graham had told people years later, well, Rocca didn't like to bleed, and I thought he should get some blood. I think he fucking bladed Rocca against his will. If you go back and look at the the newspaper accounts from the sports writers that always sat at ringside and, and in New York kind of rolled their eyes at wrestling, every single one of them says something to the effect of something went wrong and these guys were really going at it. And I don't know that Rocca was ever that convincing of a worker. I think Jerry Graham <laughs> did the job and said, well, fuck this guy needs to get some juice for me and did it. And then Rocca went crazy and got on Graham and then Graham did it to himself. And then he's gushing blood. And then here come the people in the fucking ring and they start setting shit on fire. Hey, if I was in a fight like that, if I started a riot and they had <laughs> one person to pick to watch my back, Dick the Bruiser may be the guy. Yeah, yeah. You know? and all the sports writers said, my God, he was just grabbing people and they'd come in the ring and he'd throw them out the other side. But that's the um, thing about Jerry Graham, and it's one of the big mysteries, and unfortunately there's no one to talk to really. How much of what Eddie Graham learned came from Jerry Graham as opposed to Dory Funk Sr. or anyone else? Just psychology-wise or what to do in the ring, how much actually came from Jerry Graham? I think he learned, Eddie learned from everybody. And I think a lot of that came from Jerry because he was he had already been on top. Eddie Graham had only been featured on top in Texas as Rip Rogers. <laughs> there was there was a previous Dutch Mantel and a previous Rip Rogers in Texas. And he had that, you know, main event run, but he was still young. But he the thing about Eddie Graham was he never even graduated high school. He had like a grade school education, was poor from Chattanooga, Tennessee. But he was smart to life. He was street smart and life smart. And here's another thing I found interesting. Eddie Gossett had wrestled in the Florida Territory in 1952 and again in 1955, I think, right before he went to Texas. And if you go back and look, and again, Scott Teal, thank you for the research, but if you go back and look at some of the results and clippings from Florida in the 40s and 50s, it was never a big money territory. The crowds in Tampa in the 40s and 50s were 1,500 people, 1,000 people, 2,000 people. If a national star dropped in, 2,500 people. And with, But in the 40s and 50s, with the exception of Miami Beach, which already had a some cachet as a place where rich folks went, there were no theme parks. There were no major interstates. Florida was a swamp and there was uh, there were the cities but not like it is today and wrestling had never been it had been a steady thing but never a big money territory florida may in 1960 florida may have been one of the smallest money territories in the united states as far as wrestling but when eddie graham has spent two years as the top heel tag team in new york making all that money where does he go after that? He could have gone anywhere. The, the Grams against Rocca and Perez on one day in 1959 at the Garden sold out 22,000 tickets in advance. That was the old Garden. 22,000 tickets in advance, and it, it, it turned up to 10,000 away, according to the newspapers, between people couldn't get tickets that week and people that came that night. So that means that every promoter in wrestling would have known if I get the Graham brothers, their mega box office, or either one of them, if they didn't want Jerry because of the issues. But Eddie Graham goes directly from New York to one of the smallest money territories in the business because he saw opportunity. He knew that he could go down there. He could, he'd could. he already seen the territory. He'd already seen the lay of the land. I think this had to be a concerted effort on his part. Maybe, who knows, maybe even Vince Sr. sent him down there. That's what I was going to say. Don't forget that him and Vince Sr. always had a great relationship. It starts there, but 
always had it a good in, relationship. It, it, it lasted until Vince Sr.'s death, which was three years before Eddie's. Because in the early 70s, Florida TV was on in New York, and Vince Sr. was bringing Florida talent up to put him in the garden, including Eddie and Mike Graham and Jack Briscoe and Steve Kern and blah, blah, blah. He actually only died a year before Eddie. I thought Vince Sr. died in 82. No, he died in 84, and then Eddie died, died in 84, sold in 82. Yeah. I, okay, I'm sorry. Nevertheless, so Eddie Graham made a conscious effort to go down there and become the top wrestling star on the cards, work with Cowboy Luttrell, who had ties to Texas, and then eventually bought into the promotion, what, 64, 65? He obviously was a good businessman. He saved his money. He was an alcoholic like Jerry, but he was a functioning alcoholic. Eddie Graham drank and had problems with drinking, but he still ran one of the most successful promotions in the history of the business. So I, I'm looking at it now like he knew what he was doing. And maybe even Vince Sr. sent him, said, you've seen the lay of the land. It's wide open. The The promoter's old. It's never been a big money territory. You can expand it. So what did he do? He brought the same principles to Florida as he'd learned from Dory Funk Sr. in Texas, the Cal Farley Boys Ranch. He established, helped establish that in Florida for underprivileged and at-risk, you know, young boys that needed a second chance. He was always contributing or raising money for local charities in the community in Florida. He was always getting awards from civic groups on television. Eddie Graham made wrestling in Florida not only a, a respected professional sport, and at the time, remember, 60s and 70s, what pro sports teams did they have in Florida? And he had television in every market. And he was selling in the state of Florida in the good years, well over a million live event tickets a year in one state. I mean, by God, you know, West Palm Beach was doing 125, 150,000 tickets a year. And he did all that pretty much from scratch with a territory that was barely there and that nobody really wanted to go to. And by the time he got finished with it, every top star in the business wanted to work there. You could make but the money, money was the same. <laughs> well, you could you could make money, but not as much money as you would make in some other places because that was the trade-off. You got to live in Florida. The rats wore revealing clothing 12 months out of the year because of the weather. And you got to learn from Eddie Graham. And you would potentially, if you were good enough and he took you under his wing, you could be the NWA world champion. Because his was one of the most important votes for who got the NWA title. Jack Briscoe was his protege, a shooter. He, Eddie Graham always made sure that he had wrestling and athletes up and down the card until the main event. And then in the main event, he gave them the blood and the tables and the crazy and the wild and the dusty and the chain matches and Malenko and whatever. Because he had already established this is a sport, this is a profession, it's legitimate, and these guys are crazy. And that worked. So it's amazing now to go back and look and say, and, and I finally put it together, that one of the biggest drawing box office attractions in the business immediately left New York and went to probably the tiniest territory in the country at that time, and completely transformed it. And a lot of it too, I think is about timing with TV and the power of TV. You know that, and that's something I've got to check back on. I don't even know what the TV situation was like in Florida at that point in time, but championship wrestling from Florida under Eddie Graham was in every market that had a television station in the state of Florida. Or as the fans knew it, championship wrestling with Gordon Soley <laughs> was in every market. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gotten. That's Gotten. that's to me, that's the biggest Eddie Graham rule that I wish people would follow. You need serious commentators who speak to the audience in a way that they believe and who don't get physical with anyone. They have to be the credibility of the show. They have to be the anchor of the show. All this crazy shit happens in this crazy wrestling universe. 
but it's all real because the commentator is real. Yeah. But we get away from that. But that's, to me, that's one of the most important Eddie Graham rules that I wish people would follow and no one does. That's, I think I said this when we talked about the subject, the one place I never got to work that I would have loved to have, and just, it didn't work out was Florida. As long as Eddie Graham was running it because every Bill Watts, Dusty Rhodes, Kevin Sullivan, Jack Briscoe, on and on and on. Everybody he had an influence on could do everything. If you had come around just a few years earlier, you would have been exposed to Eddie Graham, Leo Garibaldi, Louis Tillette was still around. Yeah. You just missed a lot of those guys. <sighs> and and actually, Eddie Eddie Graham was the... He was at Jerry Jarrett's housewarming party that I was at in 1982, and I didn't have the... I was still a photographer. I'd not gotten a business yet, so I didn't have the courage to go up to him and say hello. That's the only time I was ever anywhere around him. Was he at the bar? There, there was not a bar in the house, but there was a bar out by the pool, and he was socializing uh, there. Well, should we come back to modern times and depress <laughs> ourselves now? No, we shouldn't. <laughs> but <laughs> unfortunately, it's our duty. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to run through uh, SmackDown, which occurred last night as we're recording this, and then because we talked about the disastrous necessity of dynamite on Tuesday night this past week. We talked about that on the drive through and the ratings exodus that uh, it produced. We will, we will talk instead today for our AEW section on who the fuck is left. Who could possibly be a breakout star? Who could be pressed into service? to write this ship as in creative or something. We're going to look at their roster and see what's going on. Do they have a little asterisk next to whoever's injured or hospitalized or in, in an iron lung? No. Or we're going to have to guess about that because they're not very forthcoming with that. Remember the WWE for a while there, anytime somebody got injured, they'd immediately report it. AEW it, it is the exact opposite. You just don't see those people, but because there's so many of them, apparently they're embarrassed about it. Do you think a wrestling Do you think a wrestling company should publicly report injuries? Well, it depends on again, it's not necessarily a rule of thumb, but if somebody is used in a capacity, has been on television, and people are used to seeing them, and then suddenly instead of them disappearing, because if they're hurt, you're not taking them off on purpose. You're taking them off because they can't wrestle. So you still want people to remember them and like them or, hey, or whatever. So, yes, if it's somebody important, I would definitely not only tell the injury, but try to keep giving updates on that person because we don't want them to be forgotten about by the time they come back. And also it makes wrestling look, well, I started to say it, it used to make wrestling look more dangerous when you would report that a guy got injured and it was legitimate, but now I don't think anything can make this shit look more dangerous. But with, with Tony, people just disappear, and I know it's he's embarrassed because they have so many injuries to everybody. There's no reason preliminary people should ever be injured, except if they fuck up in practice. If you're having a match with a fucking preliminary guy and you're doing shit that's dangerous enough that somebody needs surgery, then you need to go back to fucking wrestling school. But nevertheless, let's start out with SmackDown, shall we? We shall. Did you see this program? I zipped through portions of it. Yeah. I saw some of Bray Wyatt, and then I was like, I don't know how much more of this I could take. And then there was a lot of women's segments, and I've always been a supporter of good women's wrestling, but I'm getting sick of the, all these women's segments because it just seems arbitrary at this point. The qualifier is good. That's the qualifier. But I, I made it through the first girls match last night live, and then I was so disheartened. I was going to watch it live because I've had a busy couple of days. We're, we were recording early this morning, so I tried the opening contest. Here come the brawling brutes, and it's Sheamus with Butch and Ridge against Solo with Sammy and the Usos. And there's nothing to matter with that, but I had an observation right at the top of this program on the differences between 
the two companies' television shows. Up and down the card, the WWE talent, they're better trained, they're in better shape, they're more serious and professional. They don't do ridiculous amateur hour bullshit. But due to the presentation of all the people in the WWE programs, I'm barely interested in most of them. And it looks like the people in the arena agree with me when they're wrestling. I hear the crowd cheering or booing, but I don't see a lot of movement from them. It's funny how that happens. The WWE shows are two and three hours long, and it seems like the same 14 guys interacting with the same people on every show, whereas on the AEW shows, there are a million guys, and the only ones you see all the time are the ones you don't want to see at all, and the ones you like, you never see. So I, I, but, but you have to, you can't hardly turn away from some of the matches simply if you're watching to wait and see who the next person is that's going to fucking hurt themselves. So that's the difference. So Sheamus and Solo was a slobber knocker, stiff stuff. This is working stiff, not dangerous, what they were doing. Except for one thing I'll talk about. There was nothing wrong with the match, but the people were sitting on their hands, and I, I detected sweetened audio. I don't know what you thought about it, but it didn't sound right. But the one problem I had with this match, did you see the Samoan drop off the second rope? I did. Now, if anybody wants to go back, and every time I say, God damn, they're doing the Samoan drop and they're not trapping the left arm, now you can go back and get a clear illustration of what I'm talking about. And I know it's a Samoan giving it. But God damn, I've, I've used to watch the actual original Samoans that started doing it, and they all did it another way. Solo gets Seamus up over his shoulder in a fireman's carry, and he's standing on the second rope, and he's going to fall back and do the Samoan drop you know, backwards off the turnbuckles. But here's the thing, and if anybody wants to go back and look at this, now you'll understand. Seamus, when he's on his shoulders and the guy's standing up straight, that's fine. But when Solo starts falling backwards, Seamus is going down sideways, not flat on his back. He's going down sideways. And his left arm is dangling, and he reached out, and he landed on his left arm slash elbow. And it could have, and he sold it, and it probably didn't feel good. And he went along because they were talking about the announcer sold it as his bad shoulder, but it was clearly the elbow. But he could have broken that fucking arm. If you trap, when you're going back, if you trap the left arm with your left hand, then you can keep the guy turning in the proper way to go down flat of his back. Because it's it's fucking physics. I don't know what else to say. And we always taught trap the left arm. So nevertheless, it's it's an awkward bump to take without that. Because you can't hold on when you're up there on the guy's shoulder. There's nothing really to hold on to to prevent that from happening unless he's helping you hold that arm to turn you. Otherwise, they had a fucking match. Boom, boom, boom. Suddenly, Sheamus hit a false finish. All the seconds got in a fight. The Usos turned the announce desk over on top of Ridge and Butch, trapping them underneath the desk so that Solo then hit his finish on Sheamus, one, two, three, and then all the heels beat Sheamus up while his backup guys were still stuck under the desk for like two minutes. They couldn't get out from under the desk. Match was fine, dangerous little spot. Finish was exciting, but the idea of let's just put a table on top of these two so they can't get up was a little ridiculous. Your thoughts? It was all right. You know, I've not been, I've, been, I've said it on the show, I'm a little sick of Sheamus, but I thought it was a pretty good match. I like Solo, notwithstanding what you said, which was right about the Samoan drop. I actually like him a lot. I think he's pretty good. It was a just fine opening match. Can't really complain too much. It is weird to go back to your other point. When you pipe in the crowd noise on a live show versus a tape show, it's a weird difference. Yeah. It always sounds off, 
But when it's a live show and it's happening, I don't know. There's something really off about it. it j- and you can see people just kind of sitting there, right? But it's ah, <sighs> anyway. yeah. you hear like a roar. <laughs> what is that? Did you hear Michael Cole say professional wrestling? At one of the on cameras at the desk, he said some uh, sports entertainment slash professional wrestling, the world of both. So now they can say both at the same time. Do you think they're going to wean people off the sports entertainment thing? It would be nice, but it's not like he said it. He says things in such an unnatural way, like pro wrestling. Like just nothing sounds fucking real from him. What we were just talking about with commentators, Michael Cole's the least effective commentator in wrestling history because nothing he says sounds genuine. I don't know about least effective. Didn't they have that Mike Goldberg at one point? Mike Goldberg. Uh, did they have Mike Goldberg? Did they have, or who, who was the one guy they got? Mike Adamley? No, Mike Adamley. I'm sorry. They tried to get Mike Goldberg and got Mike Adamley. If Mike Adamley had a 25 year run <laughs> where they had him training the rest of their announced team and in charge of commentators, you could call him the least effective commentator in wrestling history. Instead, it's this idiot yelling at us nonstop in a fake manner. Oh, all right, president of the Michael Cole fan club. Here's a question. Five is there a need? Is there a need for that's that's only in Arkansas for comedy shows? <laughs> is, <laughs> is there a need <laughs> for the term ASC? Yeah, and everybody's going, what the fuck? We don't understand. Oh. You look at Twitter more. Um <laughs> Is there a need for the term sports entertainment anymore? Because now does any is d- professional wrestling is Vince came up with sports entertainment because he felt that advertisers didn't want to be associated with professional wrestling because it was low class entertainment. So that's why he changed the name of his professional wrestling to something else. Is there a need for that now when all the wrestling shows get sponsors because, you know, there's nothing on TV that does a decent number practically anymore. <laughs> what the f- and it, I mean, besides Domino's being pissed off about the bank addicted drug robber and his pizza cutter, do, do sponsors even care about wrestling? And there's so many other things that are more unsavory in the world these days. The people who want to reach a certain demographic are willing to look at who has a large audience and try to advertise with them. If wrestling exploded tomorrow and had a giant audience, we'd have a whole bunch of new advertisers probably come in. But with that said, you know what you're getting. No one says, oh, we're going to spend some of our ad budget on sports entertainment this quarter. Some of you may know it as wrestling. No one calls it that except WWE. Non-stop. Well, that's what I'm saying. And they, well, they never have, but Vince insisted. But now that Vince is gone and they're changing things, do they need that term anymore? Because it's nonsense and it's fictitious and it was made up and it doesn't really exist. There's no such thing as sports entertainment. No, the only thing that I guess prevents it from being wiped off the map would be the fact that you have someone like The Rock whose famous promo <laughs> literally used that phrase. And then and the, the modern wrestlers will call belts titles now. So I'm wondering, even if they do get their vocabulary back straight in the WWE and call things by their actual legitimate names, they'll have to retrain the wrestlers. Because the wrestlers now, they, they have all new terminology based on what the WWE announcers call things, including title opportunity and instead of title shot and title instead of belt you know what else i heard michael cole say on this show talking about michael cole and talking about this opening match later in the show he said hospital oh well now you know vince has gone vince is probably in the hospital over that anyway we move on you mentioned the bray wyatt interview in the back of the arena and before you mentioned what you thought, which I'm kind of aware of. I will say again that this guy can talk and he can talk convincingly and he makes it sound like he's saying it. I don't know why they put the spooky background music behind the promo because he's so real that that made it fake. Like the old 
TNA sit down interviews when they had the dramatic music underneath and it, it just killed the whole fucking thing because then all you could think of was, well, they're just being fake. Here's a guy talking real, but the is, is there a fucking cassette player on, you know, next to him in the bowels of the building next to the goddamn janitor's closet? Where's the music coming from? Why do we need that? We don't just listen to the fucking guy. I don't have a clue what he said, but he sounded great saying it. He knows who you are and what you're trying to do. You tell me, explain to me, Brian, exactly oh, what yeah. Oh, yeah. Bray, Bray Wyatt was saying in this promo. You said it best. He's very convincing. He's very believable. I have no idea what he said. I have no idea what he's referring to or what he said. Nothing about this has pulled me in. This all seems like the same old Bray Wyatt. Maybe from before he had the demon mask and he was burning stuff, including himself. But I don't like this at all. The music put it over the top. Now he's just doing, again, these mystical promos. Even during the opening uh, match, there was a moment they flashed that Bray Wyatt oh, yeah, crap on yeah, the screen. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that, yeah. So it's just... But the announcers didn't refer to it. <laughs> so, no. hey, it just happens. Hey, look, I love... Sherlock Holmes. I've read every Sherlock Holmes short story. I'm a big fan of Sherlock Holmes. And after you read it, sometimes you're like, man, I wish I could do some detective work. Wrestling fans want to be their little detectives and figure out these Bray Wyatt clues. I get it. It's fun. When I was a kid, Captain Crunch went missing. We had to try to find him with shit in the cereal. <laughs> but the I remember that. I was in my 20s at the time, I think, but I remember the commercials. But the people who were holding on to this Bray Wyatt stuff like it's great it's great for what it is, and what it is is not professional wrestling. And that's my biggest problem with it. That's why he's my least favorite wrestler. None of this belongs on a wrestling show. And if anything else on this show is serious, and this guy's in a spooky basement with Halloween sounds, and then there's just various cut images into the show, like it's the young ones or something, I, I hate this. I really hate this. He's a great promo. Unless you want to understand what the fuck he's talking about. But he's very convincing. You can look him in the eyes, and he'll tell you all this, and when you're done, you won't even know what to say. Because you don't even know what he said. You have no idea what he said. You <laughs> like him. You're giving him a chance. You have no idea what the hell he said. What did he say? He had like three minutes there. Do a speech. What did he say? Well, here's the thing. I still like, it's like handsome Jimmy Valiant. His interviews, if you wrote them down and read them, didn't make a lick of sense, but the way he said it, it sounded like something he would say. At least Bray Wyatt doesn't sound like he's being told what to say. We just can't figure out what it is. But I'm thinking that if they take this guy with his talent for speaking and actually give him some kind of story to tell that makes sense and that you will understand what's going on. It might be interesting. So I'm still open here. I'm open still open. What? You see, you, <laughs> you see what's going to happen. There's going to be ghosts and goblins and mystical lightning and just people showing up dressed as weird fucking puppet animals. It's going to be all of this. And then I'm going to take that opportunity to say, well, they fucking ran me off again but you but see I'm it coming you see, it, it's like us with aew we warned everyone you see it coming don't deny tell me you see it coming do you see it coming you know where this I'm, is going you know I'm where this see, is going i'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel but it looks like the headlight of the oncoming train if he's in the bowels of the building this is the perfect way to do an aew wwe crossover he runs into moxley <laughs> i don't he might still run into mankind. Mankind might be still <laughs> down in the bowels of the build. We, every time we went to an arena in those days, we had to find the bowels first thing so they could light the bowels. You'd be surprised how many storage facilities I've been in in major NBA arenas around the country. Is that a favorite word of Vince's? The bowels of the building. That is exactly. Where is, is mankind in the bowels this week? So Sammy and the Usos were pumping up Solo on his big victory, but basically 
Jay wants to fuck up Logan Paul later on tonight, but Sammy says Roman said don't do that, and Jay does not agree, so there's going to be issues between them later on in the program. I can feel it in my bones. And then, here came Liv Morgan versus Cruella DeVille. And as I mentioned, I was watching live. I didn't have the benefit of fast forward. So I went to the kitchen and made something to eat. Because that this minuscule little Barbie girl is presented as a lunatic kicking the shit out of women twice her size is ludicrous. And so I came back with my ham and cheese sandwich. And they got... Both of them got counted out of the ring because Liv Morgan is bashing Cruella DeVille's head over and over into the steel steps, despite the fact that, you know, if you did that to Cruella, she would probably have a brain aneurysm and die. And then Liv goes out of the ring and starts grabbing chairs and is grabbing chairs from ringside and tossing them in the ring. And the crowd starts chanting, we want tables because furniture is more important than the wrestlers they're watching. You know, I bet you that I could buy a table for about $65, $70, but one of those wrestlers costs several hundred thousand dollars a year. I think I should just buy the table and just find some goddamn homeless bums to fall through it. It'd be cheaper, and that's what the people want that are buying the tickets. They don't like the wrestlers. They just want people to fall through tables. So. While Liv Morgan is going to every nook and cranny around ringside, trying at, at, to find chairs to throw in the ring, there's DeVille having to lay there, staring at her, selling, wondering, are you ever coming back to me, you fucking bleach blonde bimbo? Hey. So it buried DeVille. She had to lay there and wait forever, and then she was still selling when here comes dipshit and picks her up, and she pushed her, pushed Cruella toward the ring, and Cruella had to roll in on her own while this vapid blonde twat is looking for more chairs. Jesus Christ. This pissed me off. I understand, but Jesus. Yeah, well, it's it was so fucking phony and ridiculous. And then she gets back in the ring, and Cruella has to still sell so that the girl can sit her up on the turnbuckle with no resistance whatsoever, and then superplexed her off the top rope onto all the chairs. But goof girl, Liv Morgan, landed on the chairs too and turned over and laughed about it because she's extreme. So now the superplex bump onto steel chairs does not hurt a hundred pound girl. And that's when I left the program for the evening. We were about 45 minutes into the show. I couldn't take any more. I came back this morning where I could fast forward shit. What'd you think of this fiasco? Well, first, let me just apologize to Liv Morgan, although you may not be a great wrestler. She should apologize to me for her fucking work. Well, they should apologize for putting her on TV. I don't blame her for taking all their money. But with that said, I fast forwarded and didn't watch this. Okay, good. So, here comes Brown Strongman. And he's in the ring to do a live promo, and he's calling out almost an MVP. And I'm thinking, oh, God. This, <laughs> this could be brutal, right? But MVP comes out alone, and he cuts a promo on old Strongman. And he did a, a good job putting almost over if we hadn't already seen almost and know that whatever he does is going to be rotten. And then, of course, there's the challenge from Brown. Why don't he try it at Crown Jewel? Because the, uh, apparently the Saudis, they like social media celebrities and they like big, flat-footed, fucking dull-witted fucking giants fighting with each other. So MVP accepted it. They also and like they, showgirls from Vegas, coincidentally enough. Well, they, 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 that's not limited to the Saudis. Many people like showgirls from Vegas. Well, many people don't throw them on planes and bring them over. But anyway, go ahead. All right. So 
Brown threatened MVP, but MVP said, well, wait a minute, I didn't come here alone. I didn't say almost wasn't here. And they play the music, and here comes almost. And he slobbers his way into the ring, and is the face-off, he is a lot bigger than good old Brown. I was shocked how much bigger than Brown he was, actually. Yeah. Well, and then... It came crashing down. Have you ever seen anybody miss a shove? Well, I have now. He went to shove him, and it was like a fake-out kind of deal, where he went to shove him, but then Brown kind of jumped a little bit and and almost didn't do it, kind of like he faked him out on it. Oh, shit, was I supposed to shove you then? And then, when he does shove him, he almost missed shoving him that was the most awkward looking shove i've ever seen and instantly brown Strowman, or braun strongman or whatever his fucking name is six foot whatever 375 pounds just turns around and just leaps through the ropes and lands on the floor he pushed him through the ropes out to the floor and then brown gets up to his feet and starts laughing about it And MVP grabs almost and says, let's go, and they walk off. So that was it. That built to a shove and a laugh, and everybody just walked away. Your thoughts? Why do you call him Brown, Braun Strowman? Well, I thought his name was Brown Strongman, but then I thought it was Braun Strongman or Brown Strowman or whatever the fuck, and it just... it. (laughs) <laughs> just really doesn't make a lot of sense. He's very brawny, like paper towels. It is brawn, although I do agree with you. It should have been strong, man, but we've talked about that before. You know, this is where the uh, old Mark and me comes out. These two giants were there, and I was kind of intrigued. Okay, <laughs> let's see what's going to happen. Almost looks a lot better in a suit than he did dressed like uh, oh, he was outside the China Club. And those are my only thoughts. <laughs> Well, anyway, and I like MVP. Uh, MVP is one of my favorite uh, guys on the mic in WWE, so I'm just happy he's being used. What? But what has he done to deserve this? He, he was really he was one. really good at his job for a couple of years, especially during the pandemic. So they punished him yeah. with breaking up his very successful and well done faction and putting him with a stiff. He Kansas City himself. He did a good job when he shouldn't have, and he's been penalized for it ever since. Then for the women's tag team title, or one of them, Damage Control, a.k.a. Kai and Sky, took on Shotzi and her partner Raquel Garcia Gonzalez Rodriguez El Santo. And the best part of the girls' matches, I think, is slow-moing how many times they almost kill each other. Because if there is a... <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> If there's a mishap that's going to happen in the WWE, it's probably going to be with the girls. But nevertheless, that was that. So then, did you see the Lucha Suits and Skid Row do taped promos about each other? I did. I did see this. Neither one of these groups needs to be speaking on television, do they? Selena Vega could speak. She's actually good at it. Well, I said the groups. Well, she's now tied in with the Lucha Suits. I thought you included her as one of the suits. Well... Well, she, all right, I may get a lawsuit, but I'll include her as one of the suits. But yeah, she can talk, and top dollar, he's convinced that he's doing something right, isn't he? You can just tell. I don't... He, somebody <laughs> has convinced him that he can work, he can talk, he he doesn't look like a fucking refrigerator on a, wearing a baseball cap. You know, somebody's convinced him. B-Fab has a great look. They're lost without Swerve, and that was not apparent before they, before they cut Hit Row, but they're dead without Swerve. And I think B-Fab, like I said, has a great look. Zelina Vega may lay claim to being one of the most underutilized talents in WWE because she was great at ringside. Remember, she made Andrade watchable there. Yeah. She was great at yeah, ringside. Right. She's good on the mic. You know, she's tiny, and she could do stuff, and as long as you don't sell it, like her Hurricane Rana could kill you. It kind of looks cool seeing this tiny girl do these things at ringside. I just feel like she's constantly misused. We'll see how she does with the Lucha suits. I will say a lot of listeners got in touch and said, 
Please give them a chance. They're really good. And I was like, I thought we did give them a chance. But I don't know about them and Hit Row in a feud. It didn't end last week when they beat Hit Row. That wasn't the end of their <laughs> one match feud. <laughs> I thought that was the end, but I guess not. Oh, God. Anyway, um, Rey Mysterio had a singles match against Ludwig Kaiser. Because apparently next week we're going to get Rey and Gunther for the Intercontinental title. And this, this will be a test. Because I have all the respect in the world for Rey Mysterio. He's an innovator and a trailblazer. He's the guy. He's the exception to the rule. The guy that can get away with being that size because of his talent and his charisma and his superhero gimmick and whole nine yards. And Gunther is the guy that I've said works with opponents based on how they are presented and the it makes it logical somehow. He works with underneath guys one way, with top guys another way, with smaller guys one way, and bigger guys another way. But he always works like Gunther. So let's see if somehow these two fantastic talents can put it together where Gunther can be 6'4 or whatever, and Ray can be 5'4 and the weight difference, and they can still be compelling and i've i'm looking forward to that but in the meantime ray mysterio was wrestling ludwig kaiser and i didn't look forward to that and ray mysterio won it was all right it was pretty good there's nothing wrong with it but right. you know but, but they've, the made, they've big... made kaiser a jerk off though on the yeah. main roster he he's the introductory guy that does the nice introduction he's I like he's the virgil Usos. he's, he's a virgil flunky. yeah yeah he's the way virgil would do the job before dibiase got the match that's what he is now yeah, and and uh, honestly, uh, the Usos are more valuable as Roman's gang, and Kaiser and Wilhelm are more valuable as Gunther's gang. I can't remember what the other guy's name is, so Kaiser and Wilhelm is now what it's going to be. And uh, it's a fake Italian name. But you can't... They have to be presented as flunkies in the matches, or elsewise it doesn't work. As I've mentioned, the Usos are out there competitive against all the top tag teams, and then Roman's individual single opponent kicks the shit out of them. Same thing here. Kaiser and Wilhelm are presented as a tag team, supposed to be competitive, but when they are in the role of Gunther's flunkies, they get shit kicked out of them so Gunther can shine. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Or you can't have your Kate and Edith too. You rascal, you... Oh, the lady who... Hey, the idea of Imperium versus the Bloodline's interesting. What if Sammy decides he wants to be a European and jumps to the other <laughs> side? It would work. <laughs> Sammy European? That's right. I gotta, I gotta put that into Harley's P song. <laughs> what? Every time what? I take Harley out, especially early in the morning, I have a P song. Here we go, going out to pee. We get the funniest looks from... Every squirrel we meet, hey, hey, we're a peeing, and people say we got a pee. You're a precious little puppy, and you've got urine to pee. You don't sing to Swami? A, I don't. B, that's not a song you wrote. That's the theme to the monkeys. But C, do you sing the same version of that every day? You made it seem like before that you have different. Sometimes it changes up. Yeah, sometimes it changes. Sometimes I do a different tune. You never know. So how are you going to add European Sammy to that? European Sammy. Oh. And here we go. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I completely missed it. <laughs> oh. And Sammy's going to go out and pee. Yes, he European. And you got a lot of pee to pee. All right. So the main event... <laughs> On this program, again, was not a match. It's an interview. And, I, you know, the one good thing about modern wrestling is if Jim heard that miserable 90-year-old sack of shit that should have been banished from this earth a long time ago, and I can't believe he hadn't turned to dust by now, but he used to hate interviews. And every time we would turn in the goddamn formats, he would take out the three-minute live Ric Flair interview and make it a 30-second pre-tape, and then we'd change it back. He came from St. Louis, the only 
town in the world where they didn't do a lot of interviews. And he hated them. And he didn't want them in the start of the match, and he didn't want to, or start of the show, and he didn't want them at the finish of the show because he wanted a good wrestling bout. Well, I hope now that he sees that now the main event every week for the biggest wrestling promotion in the world is a goddamn interview just to make him miserable. But that's where we're at. They don't have they don't have an Austin versus Rock. They don't have a Triple H versus Mankind or Foley or whatever. They don't have stars that they can match on television in the main event of their flagship show, which this one now everybody says Raw's the flagship show. To me, the flagship show is the one that most people watch. And SmackDown is what? several hundred thousand people ahead of Raw every week. So, and it's network television. So, but anyway, we have a main event interview with Logan Paul concerning the Crown Jewel event and Roman Reigns. And I, again, this guy can talk. He's taken the business more seriously than the guys that are in it. He's constructed us, whether it's his story or whether they gave it to him and he's fleshed it out, about nobody takes him seriously. They don't think he's going to beat Roman Reigns, but what if he gets one lucky shot? They said he couldn't do this. They said he couldn't do that. Look where he is now. He seems serious and motivated, and he's got personality. And it's not just scripted bullshit or a monotone, un you know, interesting delivery like Ronda Rousey has been, where she's just like in a trance and don't give a shit. So I don't. Uh, I think this guy is going to do very well. Also, we've seen before. He takes the physical part seriously too, and he's been training. And of course, he's training with Michaels. I'm glad he wasn't training with Michaels 20 years ago. He'd fucking show up at the Crown Jewel, hold up the Crown Prince for more money and go in the ring pilled up so when his soma's kicked in, he could go to the finish. But hopefully Michaels is teaching other lessons now. And so with creating that doubt that he might actually win the thing, and then we've seen some of the other screwy finishes, you know, that they've done lately, so people may think, you know, hey, they might do it. What the fuck? I'm not upset about this guy being a celebrity getting into wrestling with the way that he's treated it as I'm more offended by people like fucking pockets or jelly or some of these wastes of flesh that are given free rides in the business and don't appreciate it. So I'm not, I'm not against Logan, Logan Paul and I want to see what's going to happen. But in the meantime, as soon as he was about finished, here came Jey Uso and attacks him from behind and is just kicking the teetotal shit out of him. And here comes Sami Zayn out, gets up on the apron, is like, no, Roman doesn't want this. Go to the back, get out of the ring. He distracts Jay long enough that by the time Jay turns around and goes back to Logan Paul, Logan ducks him and knocks him out with one lucky shot. Boom, goes the dynamite, and down goes Jay, colder than a banker's heart. And Logan walks off and leaves him and tells Sammy, thank you very much. And that's what it needed to be. I don't know if that's the most, if that's the most exciting thing you can put on your television show that you've got to end up the, the night with it, that's maybe a problem, but that was, that was what this segment needed to be. And we'll see what happens at the, at the crown jewel. We shall see, indeed. <laughs> I like Logan Paul a lot. I wish he was on the show more. And uh, I have to say, I'm really enjoying Jey Uso. Whatever they're giving Jey Uso, he's knocking it out of the park right now. He's doing great. Well, yeah, he and, and Sammy, obviously, but they both play off each other so well. And you got Solo doing his own thing. And Jimmy kind of being the guy that gets along with everybody. And Roman and... Heyman being the manipulators, I like the group and it's entertaining to watch them. But they got to be careful, you know, again, that they don't rely on that too too much because then these guys are going to be overexposed and 
you know, but it's it's hard not to go to the only people you got that are actually fun to watch on television when you're doing television. Here's the issue, though. I mean, we've been watching now Raw and SmackDown. After Logan Paul, and who knows what they're going to do, they're booking this for Saudi Arabia, so I don't know if they're bringing it back in a few months for the Royal Rumble for a big rematch or anything. But beyond that, where do you go with Roman and the Bloodline? Who are you going to have him work with? That would be interesting, because, I mean, Brock's back, but we've done that numerous times. And we're doing Brock versus uh, Lashley now. Brock and Lashley now. Um, Drew McIntyre's been done with yeah, Roman. That's right. Um, Cody. So, <laughs> that well, it's not time yet. He's going to be out till at least January, right? Well, technically, I think they said he's going to be out past January. It was my thought that they're going to get him back for the Royal Rumble. Mm-hmm. But if there was ever anything to make them bring Brandy in, Cody and Brandy versus the Bloodline is money. And let Brand- oh, what, what? Let Brandy cut promos against Heyman. I'm telling you, it'll be good. No, no, yes, no, yes, no, no. They can ride the bus. And they all need to be teetotalers. It needs to be a Brandy free zone. Oh, come on. It's got to be something to do with her. But anyway. Only, only if the bloodline brings in Jane Cargill. How about Cody brings in Brandy and the bloodline brings in Jacob Fatu? That would, if in all seriousness and brandy aside, set down your snifter, pal. Um, <laughs> if they brought Jacob Fatu in, that would be big money, right? Because here's the only thing about Solo that doesn't fit the suit, doesn't fit the picture, is he's short and he's normal looking for a Samoan fella. He doesn't look like a psychopath. He doesn't look like somebody that would, even though Samoans would, bite your carotid artery. Jacob Fatu's got more body weight. He's got the hair. He's got the wild, crazy eyes. He looks like a Samoan Pampiro Furpo. And from what I've seen, his work and natural athletic ability is, unfortunately, far ahead of Solo. So I'm not diminishing or knocking Solo. He's doing a great job. but. If you wanted a Samoan enforcer, a psychopathic maniac that you could believe would go off and do some damage to people, and it can do some amazing shit visually and looks the part, I mean, you know, I, I, at this point, is it is it a criminal record in the background, or is it his age, he's gone too far, or now do they just not want to admit that they've made a tragic mistake? And somebody ought to buy this fucking guy away from Court Bauer while he's still able to get in the ring and do what he does and put him on a main stage because you don't find people that do this shit or look like that on a regular basis. There are other people with criminal records who work there, so that shouldn't be a disqualifier. Hey, you want to do some fantasy booking and you want to really talk about why Tony Khan wants a non-compete? Sure. CM Punk wins the Royal Rumble. Punk, Roman Reigns, WrestleMania. How big would that be? Boom goes the dynamite. Then you, again, right there, they, they could generate enough money that night if they did that at WrestleMania to pay Punk's contract for three years to just do that match, and they would be able to rub it in Tony's face. You have a good story there. Heyman used to manage Punk years ago. He was the first guy, I think, really after Brock that he managed was Punk. Yeah. And all these years later, he has a new love, Roman Reigns. Be easy to play this up, be easy to do this, and you'd get a big gate in Chicago. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's the problem. There aren't too many guys we could think of. I mean, Randy Orton, we haven't heard any sign that he's coming back, and I don't know if he's the answer for this, but who does Roman and the Bloodline work with? We've already seen Roman and Jey Uso. Remember, that's how this all really started a few years ago. I don't want to see him and Bray Wyatt. And it sounds like Bray Wyatt's going to feud with himself. So I don't, so I really don't know. What would you do with Roman right now? If a guy has a, has a feud with himself, who gets the winner's purse when they have the match? The attorney. There you go. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know because they don't have a lot of options because there's not a lot of names left in the business that mean anything because none have been created over the last 10 years. Would you elevate a Braun Breaker for this? <sighs> 
But still so soon because he's got all the tools and he's got all the potential and I'd hate to sidetrack him or make it harder for him later on just to rush him now. There may there at worst there may be backlash from fans or he just might not be ready to to look as impressive as he has looked in that position with that kind of spotlight on him. I think I'd be rushing it just a bit. Do you agree it has to be someone new, not someone that Roman's worked with already? Because it seems like a lot of these guys, as you mentioned, he's worked with Brock, Drew McIntyre, he's worked with a lot of them a lot. Well, and and you can always have rematches, and especially shit that the people liked to begin with, but you can't just do it constantly. It can't just be recycle, recycle, recycle. And and that may be the problem is there's not only nobody there that he hasn't worked with that would mean anything, but also there's nobody anywhere else out there that they could just bring right in and would mean something unless they put some time and effort into building that person if they were able to get them contractually. So, you know, good luck. Yeah, they may stall until Cody can come back because that may be their only hope right now to get Roman a main event opponent that's fresh. And then if they're going to do... If if it's ever going to happen, The Rock and Roman Reigns, it would have to be next year at WrestleMania, right? Because nobody's getting any younger and they're in Los Angeles and by the next year, the bloom may be off the rose. You would think so because of the Los Angeles end of it. I guess it all depends on what The Rock is currently doing. He's now a producer on his own films. He knows his schedule. Is he blocking out time to train for WrestleMania, work WrestleMania, and then get surgery afterwards for whatever he's going to get hurt? Because he's going to get hurt. No, every one of these guys comes back. Even if they have a great match, they're going to get hurt. It happens every time. It's the style they're working. It's going from not wrestling but to all of a sudden with, wrestling. With, with The Rock and Reigns, I don't think they would have to do anything that would be exceptionally dangerous to still get the point across. And I, they're I both agree. good. I, I'm saying that I think, hypothetically, The Rock may be so jacked up on some stuff that he'll tear a muscle doing something. Oh, come on I'm now. not even joking. I think that's exactly what will happen if The Rock has a comeback match. We will hear about him getting surgery within a month for some sort of damage. It won't be serious, but he's going to get hurt. They all do. Everyone who comes back gets hurt. Well, in that case, I'm going away again. I'm not coming back anymore. Speaking of going away and coming back, something that happens every day over at the Wrestling News. What's going on these days in the Arcadian Vanguard world? Perhaps you slept through SmackDown, perhaps you missed Raw, Dynamite, Rampage, Impact, whatever it may be. Perhaps you want to know, in the morning, what happened overnight? Is everyone alive? Has anyone died? What are the ratings? Who's on the roster? What's going on in wrestling? There's now a source for wrestling news with no opinion, no conjecture, not getting worked by people, actual news, and that, of course, is the wrestling news. Go to thewrestlingnews.com or look for Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Free, daily, morning wrestling newscast covering the entire world of professional wrestling. It doesn't go very long. A lot of people have it with their coffee. You too can enjoy The Wrestling News each and every morning. Once again, thewrestlingnews.com available wherever you find your favorite podcast. And thank you. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed already. What's the title of that program again? The Wrestling News. At the Wrestling I have it every program. morning with my Sprite Zero. With your Sprite Zero. Oh, that's right, you don't like coffee. I apologize for referencing coffee there, but a few other notes here on the show. Want to make mention of the latest episode of Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, his guest, John McAdam. I'm Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Check that out today at suawpod.com. Or look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention for patrons of Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry at patreon.com slash Baldrin and Barry. The boys interview the widow of Frenchie Bernard. Hear that today, all about life on Andre's Ranch. Once again, patreon.com slash Baldrin and Barry. That's right, Jackie. Did you know her? Very nice lady. You met her a couple times. Also want to make mention of the 605 Super Podcast. The- I knew you'd get it in there sooner or later. I was wondering if you hit the wrong button. I usually don't get such a 
pleasant response, but go through the archive today. There it is, 605pod.com. You brought my whole tone down. 605pod.com. Are available wherever you find your favorite podcast, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. All right, Mr. Mothership, uh, what we are going to try to do now, and we're going to take their word for it, the AEW website on who works for them, or <laughs> last time they checked who, who was working for them, and we're going to go up and down the roster briefly and see if they do have the makings of an actual wrestling promotion there or if they're hopelessly infested with the trampoline cowboys and can't field a decent team because we can't watch their television program and keep track of who wrestles there because you don't see people for months at a time so do you have that roster in front of you brian i do and just for argument's sake i looked at the ring of honor roster but it appears they have not updated this page since the sale oh boy all right well and it may be more difficult than we imagined um well jim but <laughs> Oh, go ahead. Ed, is it is it alphabetical, or how have they arranged this? It's alphabetical, but why don't we start with the champions? Okay. Well, that'll take all day. The current... <laughs> Only AEW champions. Okay. The current AEW World Heavyweight Champion is John Moxley. Okay. Regardless of what I personally think about Plumber Moxley, he's a name... And the team is in need, and considering the rest of the state of the field, I would keep him. I would just not let him surrender to his worst and or stupidest instincts. You know, and, and I would try to make him serious about being my world champion and my top star instead of going and begging on to be on outlaw shows just because he likes to have fun playing with children in barbed wire but i'd keep moxley because you could get something out of him if you could control him uh, for this i'm only going to do the men's roster not the women's roster right now well yeah yeah for heaven's sake they got bigger problems than whether they got a good female roster or not the AEW world tag team champions are the acclaimed max caster and anthony bowens Okay, and obviously I would keep them too, because even though they're greener than pepper trees still, you know, they've got energy and enthusiasm and excitement and the people have liked them. And yes, the scissoring thing is ludicrous, but at least they're not scissoring with their opponents and making everything phony. It's just their goofy baby faces. So I can live with that. And I admire the the work that they've done in getting themselves over and in, you know, it, it, doing it all themselves because, again, it's not something that their booking has helped with. But I'd keep the acclaim. The AEW Trios World Tag Team Champions, Death Triangle, Penta okay. El Zero Miedo, Ray Phoenix, and Pac. When is the next train to Tijuana or the boat to Britain? I don't know if there's a direct train to Tijuana. Well, let's see if we can charter one. Okay, first of all, Pac, I've said it before, I'll summarize. Looks like a million dollars. Tremendous looking athlete. Looks like a badass. Great physique. Can move around and do shit. Has no idea whatsoever how to have a fucking match. They all fall apart. He won't stay off the top rope, even though it takes him an hour and a half to come off of it. And all of it, in all of his matches, instead of trying to be an ass kicker like he looks, he tries to be a goddamn gymnast like the rest of them. And it's been three years. If we were going to see anything different, we'd have seen it by now. And the same thing with Penthouse and Felix. You see one of their matches, what's the difference? They do the same shit in the same way. And it all looks phony, and they're holding hands and doing cheerleading routines. If I was booking the El Toreo bull ring in Mexico, I'd put them on top. For an American television promotion, just, they're the shits. So let's put those in the toss column. Beyond your feelings about their work or anything else, do you also take into account they've been there since the very beginning? If you're looking at this as something moving forward, 
Yes. Do you want to mix up the roster? Yeah, again, we've seen all that we can see from these people. They do the same fucking shit all the time. And, you know, again, yes, they're, they're big names in the world of Lucha Libre. And I have no problem with them inhabiting that world. But the matches they have with the rest of their friends that want to do leaps and dives and flips and cartwheels and round offs and uneven parallel bars, it's just bullshit and it's all the same. The AEW TNT champion is Wardlow. Good Lord. Well, I would say keep him, but I wish he would hurry up and go to the WWE because he's... We looked up his his age. The clock is ticking. He's in his mid-30s. If he doesn't do it sooner, sooner than later, he's not going to do it at all. And, you know, what an opportunity for somebody to take advantage of this guy and his natural magnetism. But they have so far shot themselves in the foot on that. But yes, I'd keep Wardlow. The AEW All-Atlantic Champion is Orange Cassidy. Ah, do we have an incinerator rather than a garbage can? We don't, but, appa but apparently he's a train to Tijuana. Well, good. Well, put him on that and then blow up the bridge <laughs> as it heads across the Rio Grande. Uh, no, he needs to not only be fired, but also penalized or punished in some way for crimes against nature. Yeah, he's done. Get him the fuck out of there. All right, those are the current male AEW champions. Again, we're not counting Ring of Honor champions or any other affiliated title that, or FTW title even, I guess. We're going to go in alphabetical order through the men's roster here. Jim Aaron Solo of The Factory. I mean, you know, when we get down this far, can anybody ever even say, wow, what a match Aaron Solo had because he's never on television except if he's in the group that does QT's job or whatever and I don't really know whether he has potential or not but are we getting down to saying okay if we can find a good wrestling school and put these guys in it we'll keep them if they're booking him per night and giving him a little experience fine but I can't even honestly say that's a legitimate roster member right and I don't think this is some young new wrestler who hasn't been around in a while. So when you talk about training them, I mean, there's honing up on your skills, but this isn't a wrestler who needs to be freshly trained. Well, yes, it is. Or it <laughs> shouldn't be, I guess, is the way I should put it. Well, no, he's been around for a while, but, I, you know, again, can you even, I don't even think we need to write him down in the keep or get rid of because he's barely there as it is. And there's any one of, right now, just being honest as a talent, evaluator there's any one of a hundred guys that could do the same thing he's doing which is nothing so if they have a group of guys they want to concentrate on for three years down the road and have a plan and it's a manageable number of four or five or six guys that's one thing but if it's just like oh so and so trained him so we'll keep him around and then there ends up 20 of those what are you fucking doing well here's an interesting one for you adam cole well, we need an injured reserved list because, again, this is tough. In a, in a perfect world, the Adam Cole from NXT would have wandered in and done some business, but instead they put him in with the kids and he got hurt and he's never, he hadn't wrestled in the last, what, four months because they were doing all that goofy shit that caused him to get hurt. A a again, I would keep Adam Cole on the roster. I would just try to get the best of Adam Cole instead of the worst of it. I would encourage him to eat a Twinkie every once in a while, put on a pound or two, maybe do a push-up. But more importantly, I would just get him away from the Hardly Boys and the rest of the bad influence and let him be the talent that he used to be. So in some of these cases, we're going to keep a guy that's been the shits because he cannot be the shits. He has that opportunity. He has that option. Pockets doesn't have that option. He's going to be the shits regardless of what he tries to do about it. So I'd keep Adam Cole, but he's injured. Hangman Adam Page. Psh, 
Page can go because of his attitude, and it ain't never going to get any better. He's never proven that he can do anything well except backflip off the top rope blind. He can't cut a fucking believable promo. He's a problem in the locker room. He started all this goddamn hoo-ha, but he's also been the guy running his pie hole saying, well, I don't take advice from veterans. We've figured all this out on our own. You can't do anything like with a guy like that because you can't help people that don't want to help themselves. He doesn't want to learn. He doesn't want to admit his mistakes. He doesn't want to straighten up his attitude, and he thinks he's a star even though he's not. That's the first person I'd get rid of. You can find people that can do that athletic shit all day long, and if you want a cowboy, you can find one that looks more like a cowboy than the guy that wears butterflies on his fucking jeans and a fucking pancake box fucking mix headband. All right, well, what about Alex Reynolds of the Dark Order? Which one is he? He is the one that teams with the one you call Little Brutus. Oh, yeah, he can go. There's a, You can find another fucking hundred guys that can do whatever the fuck he does. And what? also, three years in a job guy group that's been a joke since the beginning. Clean your fucking closet out, Tony. Go ahead. Keep going. Andrade El Idolo. People say he can work. Do we ever see him work? Or does he just stand in the back and bring out the assistant and have unintelligible mumble marble-mouthed interviews with other underneath talent? He is a talented wrestler. I liked him when he was a masked wrestler as La Sombra. I okay. don't think anything's been done to make him stand out to a United States television wrestling audience. He's just another guy who can have good matches, and his character hasn't worked. Okay, in that case, let's keep Andre Olio Leo, and let's make it a rule that he never speaks again, and we put Alex Abrahantes with him as his manager so that Andre can speak Spanish, and then Alex can say, and Andre says, you know, why don't you do well, now fantasy book in this that you came up with this. You could do what they did with Waldo Von Erich. I mean, not to that level where he says something so offensive that you ban him from talking ever again on TV. And whatever he has to say has to come through Alex or he has to whisper it to Alex. And then Alex has to say, because <laughs> that's what they did, right? Waldo Von Erich was banned from talking on TV. So he'd have to whisper to the Grand Wizard what he wanted to say. And then I the thought- Grand Wizard would yell it. I always, the way I heard the story, it cost him the TV in Cleveland or wherever it was. It cost him the TV somewhere once. It may have been Cleveland. I forget what town, but that wasn't even the WWF. That was uh, NWF. Yeah, that was the the Pedro Martinez. We can't say on this show what he said on TV, can no, we? No, I certainly would not. And, uh, and it's amazing. <laughs> so everybody's going to be sitting there going, what the fuck did he say? It's amazing the things you used to be able to get away with, but. Maybe that would work for Andrade. Well, he didn't get away with that either, though. No, that's true. That's true. And never used a curse word. Well, speaking of people who get away with stuff, (laughs) what would you do about Angelico? Oh, Jesus Christ. Can we find... Can Is there a plastic bag you just dump him in, throw him off a bridge? No. Well, in that case, just fire him. That option is not there, so I guess we'll be firing Angelico. Yeah. Cool Hand Angelo Parker of the Jericho Appreciation Society. Okay, you know, honestly, and boy, we're still only in the A's. If 2.0, Cool Hand Luke and his partner, Daddy Mac Mac Daddy, if they weren't with Jericho, they do have, as you said, a lot of oomph to them. Yeah. If they could be re- revamped and retrained, I, I would keep them because the only... Thing they it was just two guys that came out of nowhere, got shoved down our throats, and then were you know in, immersed into this Jericho Appreciation Society sports entertainment bullshit, where you know the one guy's got a switchblade comb and blah blah blah. There may be something there. We could keep them, see what happens. What about the governor, Anthony Agogo of the factory? He needs to go go. Wake me up, Anthony, before you go go. Because he's had two matches. What's his... Hold on. Fuck. What's Anthony Agogo's record for 2022 overall? So that means tag matches and singles matches. What do you think his record is? What, zero and zero? When's the last time we saw the fucking guy? 
Apparently he's 14 and 0. What? I guess this is all on YouTube. We've never they tried to make a guy with that Cody program and then we never saw him on TV ever again. Well, he was a boxer, high-level athlete from another sport. That's fine. They I guess Cody was training him. That's fine. That was a couple of years ago. He went back to England, had I think another eye surgery cuz he's blind in one eye. Yeah. Now, is he in his early 30s? We don't know. How, I don't know how old he is, but he's been a boxer. Now, he's been wrestling for a couple of years part-time. He's another guy. Yes, if you had four or five guys, we're going to fucking invest in them. We're going to bring them along. We're going to give them experience, whatever. And you decided to plan for them, and that's those people. But when you've got 25 of them, what the fuck? And, you know... <laughs> Somebody else needs to worry about this. You're putting a roster together for now, not for five years from now, with all of these people. I don't... Has he been standing out? Apparently out in the parking lot is where he's been standing, but I, 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 don't, I don't have room for go-go to stay-stay right now. Austin Gunn of the Gun Club. Definitely keep... Let's put Colton down there, too, while we're at it, even though he's not alphabetical. Because, well, what, about, what about Billy Gunn? Well, of course. All, all three of the guns. I don't know that I would have broken them up, although Billy's probably happy about it. But Colton and Austin are the one of the heel teams of the future. Okay, we'll leave it at that. There you go. What about Brendan? Oh, excuse me. It's not Brendan. It's Brandon Cutler. Cutlet can be served in another restaurant. Gone. Do you think he could be served as a meal to the machine, Brian Cage? Well, Cage could certainly drive him. Uh, so Cage can go too. Uh, I mean, Cutlet, somebody tell us what he does besides went to grade school with the Hardly Boys. He's there. He's not a real wrestler. He's not a real manager. That's right. He does. He is there for comic relief in a funny outfit at ringside. Their matches are already hilarious enough, often unintentionally. He has no purpose, and he shoot he shoots their video. I'm sure there's people that can shoot video that don't have to be presented as wrestlers. So no, Brandon Cutlet is probably the most single most useless person on that roster, except for. Michael, knock it, knock it, knock it, knock it the fuck off. Who is apparently in his 40s. So go ahead. And, and yeah, and Cage is, I mean, you can't rehab Brian Cage. He's a fucking meathead who thinks that he knows how to work and his matches are rotten and he can't take advantage of his nature-given physique, which is the only positive thing about him. So, no, immediately... Run him off. All he does is make guys with good bodies that can work look smaller. Brian Pillman Jr. I is he still there? I'd keep He's him. listed on the roster page. I mean, I don't know how updated this is. I would I would keep him to see if we could go back in time to last year or whatever when he might could have gotten over and see if we can do that. Uh, obviously Griff Garrison needs to go away quickly. Um, yeah, keep Pillman. Griff is gone. Would you try Pillman as a heel? <sighs> Probably eventually. Maybe he, maybe you could get some kind of mileage out of Griff just if Pillman finally had enough and Griff lost a fall and Pillman went in there and pile-drived him and said, fuck you and fuck everybody and fuck this company. I should have been a goddamn star when my dad was on Dark Side of the Ring. And I've been working my ass off and I never get booked because I'm not friends with those fucking, you know, Peter Puffin clowns over in the corner. So I'm just mad at everybody and then become a heel. That might work. It would certainly be believable. What about Brock Anderson? I had forgotten he existed. Me too, until I saw his picture here. You know... I <laughs> Again, you hate to say that the offspring of a guy like Arn Anderson wouldn't have a spot on your roster, but when I saw Brock, I wasn't blown away, and we've never seen him again, so I probably think maybe Brock is selling cars at some point. 
Brody King of the House of Black. You know, that's interesting because a lot of people liked him when he came in. Of course, that always happens. <laughs> They're popular they come in on his program. He's a big, fat, tattooed guy in the whole House of Black thing, but he can move around a little bit. I don't know that we've ever seen him, you know, really stand out in any way, but at the same time, you know, he's not a complete clown like Angelico or whatever. He's a giant guy covered in tattoos. Do you think the fact that that doesn't stand out anymore in wrestling says a lot about the way everyone looks in wrestling nowadays? That may, that may be part of the problem because 30 years ago, he would have been unique. And now he looks so much like every other jack off that doesn't know what he's doing because every fucking guy that age is a big fat fuck with pots and pans hanging off their ears and goddamn nuts and bolts stuck through their nose and tattoos on every part of their body. So it's not unusual anymore. I could, I could put him down with an asterisk, see what happens if you send him in a different direction, whether there's anything there, but I, I don't know. Brian Danielson of the Blackpool Combat Club. Um, not only definitely keep him, but also if we could erase the last 10 months, he'd be the AEW World Heavyweight Champion. No more needs to be said. Buddy Matthews of the Dark Order. Oh, excuse me, of the House of Black. I get confused with all these. Or whichever things. one. Let's see if see if he can get in the Buddy system somewhere else. Buddy's gone. A AAA and Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champion, Cash Wheeler of FTR and the Pinnacle. Well, it, for fuck's sake, FTR is down here. Uh we're keeping both of them not like that that's a surprise and they're the world tag team champions because they're the best tag team in the business and then we would bring mark and jay briscoe over to fucking fight them so we could have more great state-of-the-art tag team matches and they might sell some tickets so yes ftr is firmly here on the roster the ring of honor world heavyweight champion chris jericho of the jericho appreciation society <sighs> Now, you can't deny his star power. Yeah, and I said the same thing for Moxley, and that's why I kept Moxley, and, and thinking that hopefully that he would be able to do as instructed. Jericho, at this point, though, he's he's been there. We've seen it. I think if you were to keep... You can't change Chris's mind. He's firmly stuck in, in 15 years ago WWF, and he wants to be the guy, and he's trying to run everybody out of his way. But if you could control his personality and you could send him home for a while with an injury or whatever and let people miss him because he went away and bring him back as Chris Jericho, legendary wrestler, he's a baby face, and he comes back and, and has a program with another top guy, that might work. But now he's just been hanging around for so long and doing his stupid shit and people are tuning out in droves and he's surrounded with job guys so he can be the star and he ain't getting anybody over so i wouldn't have a spot for him right now christian cage is if he was healthy uh and he's got the arm injury situation taken care of he's the perfect guy to put in the ring with the young guys to slow them down and teach them how to think and listen I would always have Christian around my company. He'd be a producer if he couldn't get in the ring. Speaking of producers, Christopher Daniels. I love Chris Daniels. I liked his work. I liked him as a person. I always enjoyed working with him. He's with the pro wrestling chimpanzee gang. Maybe it's just because he's from California and knows him a little better or whatever. That would make me think, okay, is there a mole in the locker room that is going to report back to the cosplay crowd. But otherwise, just the experience I've had with Christopher Daniels, at this point with his, his age, obviously, he would be an agent slash producer. Uh, but, you know, with his experience and his knowledge, and he's not a, a guy that has bad habits or whatever, I would want Chris Daniels around. I would just be concerned that he is, his mind has been polluted by the buckaroos 
All right, moving on. Moving on, I did not realize that this was the nickname of this wrestler. The Kentucky Gentleman, Chuck <laughs> Taylor of the Best <laughs> Friends. Yeah, get old Chuckle Fuck a fucking rented minivan so Trent's mother can ship him out. No, this it's ridiculous. That's again a friend job, a favor job. The guy looks like shit. The guy can't fucking work. He's the epitome of an indie wrestler, some jack off that can wander into a barn and get in the ring and be allowed to do it. Chuck Taylor. What the fuck? Let's play the name game. Chuck, Chuck. Bo Buck, Banana Fana, fuck you, take the fuck off, and don't slander Kentucky while you're at it. Moving on. Certainly a different name game than I'm used to. Claudio Castagnoli of the Blackpool Combat Club. Well, no Blackpool Combat Club, but Claudio Castagnoli would be on any roster that any sane, reasonable person would put together because not only is he a great talent, but also he's a heck of a guy. He doesn't have bad habits, and he's smart and capable of helping in a variety of ways they've used him rotten and now when's the last time we saw him on tv has it been a month no him and wheeler Yuta, i think ran in to save uh who would they have saved well i'm talking about wrestling instead of doing stooge work with job guys but anyway yes claudio's a keeper in anybody's book again this is how the roster is currently listed on their website cm punk well, everybody knows what I think there. The next name on the list here, Boom Boom Colt Cabana of the Dark Order. Oh, good Literally lord. Literally next to Punk on the roster page. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye, Boom Boom. Let's move on. You already mentioned Colt and Gun, Danhausen. Well, let's write that one down next to Pockets and... You know, if that kid had just done weird interviews at FanFest and I'd never actually seen him wrestle or the cursing thing or the whole thing, I, you know, might not be so hard on him, but Jesus H. Christ. So we're getting a big line of people to send away and we don't have a ton of them to keep. Go ahead. The Ring of Honor pure champion, Daniel Garcia of the Jericho Appreciation Society. You know, see, here's the thing. If they had done this in any way like a sane, normal, reasonable person, Daniel Garcia in the opening matches, he's a young, early 20s kid. He's athletic. He's got some size. He can wrestle a little bit. He can't talk. He ain't got any personality, but he's barely old enough to fucking enlist in the army. He can't. He's not even old enough to rent a car. These are the kind of guys you never know. That's why you put him over somewhere. He'd be one of the five or six. You put them over somewhere and you bring them along slowly and you get them ready for three years from now or whatever. But this guy comes in with absolutely no personality or oomph to him, just a guy doing moves. And because that is who the modern indie wrestler like the Cucamonga Kids or Twinkle Toes or whatever, that's the kind of person they look for because they can't determine money drawing talent. And they don't know how to develop talent from what it is now to what it could be. They just see, oh, he's like a chimpanzee. He can do a bunch of moves, so let's use him. And he's a nice guy. There's a lot of nice people that I wouldn't necessarily put in certain positions. So if I was going to operate a wrestling promotion, Daniel Garcia's a guy, I'd say, okay, we'll keep him underneath. We'll put him in the preliminaries. We'll give him some experience, let him work with some people and see how he develops. But right now, after the way they've used him, no, fuck no. Jesus Christ. It's, it's just running viewers off because everybody knows it's like a, it's like when they were, when they were trying to push Rocky Maivia to the moon and the people rebelled against it because the roster was so filled with talent and they could tell Rocky was green and they were, pushed him on purpose, and they rebelled against it. People can tell wh who is Daniel Garcia and why should he be here. So I'd give him some time off and let him come back later on at a, another point. With Rocky Maivia, the fans sniffed out that it wasn't natural, that he was playing a role that wasn't even a role he came up with. Right. And that he was winning constantly, even though he wasn't ready for that spot, based on the competition on the roster of other people that were more experienced and more, at the time, more over and more established. 
Jim, what about Dante Martin of Top Flight? When was the last time that name was mentioned? Top Flight or Dante Martin? Dante Martin, either one. It's been a while. It's been a bit. You know, again, I don't... He had tremendous freakish athletic ability and that leaping, but he had, you know, mutt face and just hangdog expression and no personality. And, you know, it, maybe as a baby face, because he's an underdog kind of kid, he had talent. He was very green. He was having a lot of those cosplay matches with the trampoline bunch where that they would just do flips and he wasn't learning anything. If he'd been in a place with a lot of veterans that could try to impart some wisdom and teach him how to channel that athleticism, then maybe put a mask on him, cover up that moop face, and you'd have a kid superhero flying around. But I don't know. I've never... You know, I don't, I, well, you know, I did meet him. He was in MLW about three or four years ago. But I don't know whether he's now convinced by these people that he was a star and he knows everything and this is what he ought to be doing, or if he would accept, okay, you've got a lot of ability and a lot of athletic talent, but you need to be completely retrained and approach it a different way. Who knows? I Let's put him with a, he's a question mark next to Brody King. And there's a, another wrestler in between these two I'll get to in a second, but on the other side is Darius Martin, the top flight, his brother. And I wanted to ask you the question in general, if you have a talented young wrestler who you see something in, but they frequently get knee injuries, what do you do? How do you proceed as a promoter? Well, if they're a high flyer, then you proceed on to the next person because they ain't going to last very long at all. If that's the only thing that they do that stands out and they have multiple knee injuries, then you're, you're buying damaged goods. If they can... Rico Constantino, when he was in OVW, was doing flips and backflips and moonsaults because he was a goddamn... Not only had he been a you know, a police officer, an EMT and paramedic, and he'd been in American Gladiators, but he was also very gymnastic and he was a bodybuilder. He could do all kinds of shit. But then as a baby face, he's doing all the flips and flying stuff, even at 230 with a great physique, but he blows his knee, has knee surgery. So when he came back, he altered his style. We switched him heel. He had more personality as a heel and could talk and stayed on the ground more because he didn't have to be so flashy and impressive. If you can modify what you do after you have an injury that prevents you from doing what you were doing, then that's great. If that's the only thing you can do and you hurt yourself and can't do that, well, then you're fucked. In baseball, a pitcher sometimes will hurt their shoulder, hurt their elbow, grow older, lose velocity, have to change the way they pitch. If you can't blow someone away with a 100-mile-per-hour fastball, you have to become a smarter pitcher do things differently, but maybe more effectively or as right. effective. In wrestling, should wrestlers, how do I put this? If you're a wrestler who is a high flyer and you lose the ability to do everything you're doing or a lot of what you're doing, or you just shouldn't do it if you don't want to keep getting injured, should this be an opportunity to make yourself a smarter wrestler? Because you can't, you, you have to look at things a different way. Well, it's not only an opportunity, it's mandatory. And the ones who do that are the ones who last, and the ones who don't are the ones who go away. And you've always got to constantly evaluate what you're doing in the ring as far as, for example, when you're trying to get over, you're going to do more than when you're already over. When you're already over, you can do that same thing, but only when it counts. Bobby Eaton was taking ridiculous bumps in Mid-South Wrestling because he'd never made money like that in his life and he wanted to get over and he did get over. And the Midnight Express got over. But then three, four years later, now the Midnight Express is over and now it's a different thing. Now you're not trying to get to get over. You are already over. And as a result, you're in a spot where if you get hurt, it not only fucks up you and your partner, but it fucks up the company. Because now you're not a wrestler working hard on the undercard trying to get over and hurt and out of action. 
you're a guy that's already done that. You're in the main events. If you still work the same way and you're just bumping your ass off and just doing everything you can every night, small house or large house, small town or large town, small payoff or large payoff, sooner or later you're going to get hurt. You're going to fuck the company up. That's where you learn to back up and pick your spots and only take your special bumps on the big shows or or go the extra mile on a television program or whatever. And then the guys you're working with that are young and trying to get, you can let them take some of the bumps because they're still trying to get over. It's a constant evolution. And then you get to the status where you're a legend. And then you can have, a, if you're Steve Austin, you can have a match and not leave your feet. And nobody notices or gives a shit because you're a fucking megastar. And then you can get more mileage out of it that way. But it's only the fucking ignorant people that just go out there and just dive off everything they can every time they get a chance or call up outlaw promoters and want to be booked on it even though they've got guaranteed contracts because they just love playing with the children. And that's where you fucking get hurt because you don't listen and you don't learn and you don't evolve and you think, Oh God, this is all of, this is playtime now. This isn't business. So I can just be reckless if I want. Who's next? Speaking of reckless, Darby Allen. You know, I'd keep the motherfucker. I would laugh at him as a human being and as a blithering idiot every fucking time I saw him, but I'd keep him because he's got a weird charisma with young people who seem to like the idea of just for no compensation or apparent reason trying to kill yourself. But he's got something. I'd keep him. Next on the list, well, we already did Dax Harwood, Dustin Rhodes. I saw Dustin just tweeted uh, a few days ago that he was evaluating his situation because age catches up with everybody and he's been phenomenal. Dustin would definitely be there, whether it was in the ring or behind the scenes as someone to give some advice. If, if you had a group of people who would listen to advice, he could probably give some good advice. I'd keep him. Eddie Kingston. You know, and we said this, Eddie Kingston, they could have had a tremendous beloved baby face off that, what, Players Tribune article or whatever. But now it seems like Eddie still thinks that he's going to fucking outlaw shows and indies where he can just wander in the locker room and say anything to anybody and it doesn't matter and he don't see those people for a while or whatever. But he doesn't like anybody and he's he's had altercations with a few people. and. I know it's part of his gimmick, but he's been on national TV for a couple years now. It doesn't look like he's put any money in different tights or any time in, in the gym to mitigate the look somewhat. I'm on the, I, I like his promos, but at the same time, out of between the way he's been presented, is he stuck in his ways? I'm on the fence about Eddie now. What about all ego Ethan Page? Yeah, he can go all the way out. So we've we've dumped Adam Page or Ethan Page. We've we've I think we've you turned dumped Adam several Page pages. Too. Yeah, we yeah. turned several pages. Well, are you gonna turn the page on Evil Uno or the Dark Order? Please, as quickly as possible. He'll be delivering pizzas. Pizzeria Uno. Will he be delivering pizzas to Frankie Kazarian? No. Because Frankie Kazarian would be on the roster because he's a, an experienced athlete. He's a good-looking guy. He's got timing and presence. And I would use him as the upper middle card baby face. Upper middle card? Upper middle card baby face gatekeeper to the upper echelon. If a heel can beat Kazarian, then he can get up and play with the big boys. Because Frankie's oh. older now. I'm not fucking... I'm not going to, you know, say, oh, he needs to be the world champion, but he's got experience and he knows what he's doing. If you get him away from the children again, you know, and, and say, okay, now we're being serious again, Frankie, he can do that. And I think he could be an upper card guy. 
I think if he had been booked differently, you may have an argument there. But I think at his age and his presence in AEW since the very beginning, I don't think there's any way you can make him that kind of guy now. If you want to say you want him on the roster to help guys, and it'll be at the most mid card, but upper mid card. Yeah. I don't think well, anyone accepts him like that. Well, no, that that's what I'm saying is that he he beats the middle and the and the underneath guys, and it, for the guy for the heel to cross him, he's a good a good gatekeeper there. You beat Kazarian, then you go up to the main events. What about Fuego del Sol? Yeah, he can Fago del off. And you said the same thing about Griff Garrison, correct? Yeah, co- seriously. Fucking Pippi Longstocking was just holding fucking Pillman back, and Pillman's the one they'd beat every time instead of that fucking long, tall drink of water. The FTW champion is Hook. Hook, again, I'd keep. He's got something, and he had something until we stopped being able to see him, and then he got thrown in with Dan Housen and a bunch of other jack-offs or whatever, but the kid... He's one of the small group of guys you start now and bring along slowly for a few years from now. Isaiah Cassidy, a private party. <sighs> What's the other private party's name? Mark Quinn. He's the one that can really jump even better than fucking Dante Martin. I, but... Again, we never, we haven't seen him in ages. We didn't see him regularly to begin with. They tried to put him over at the start until the Bucks actually did put him over, and that killed him because they put him over in that phony way. Uh, they're green. Quinn can leap like crazy. I don't know about Cassidy. Probably not. Quinn, I would keep and again hide somewhere in training until he could use his athletic ability, but not be tempted to go into full full on square dancing routines with the rest of these jack offs and as i remember what he looks like probably put a cool mask on him also because he's got a moop face of his own but he'd be a kid superhero what? with that high flying bullshit you think everyone has a moop face i just remember him if it no what you know now maybe i'm you know what i'm thinking of street profits i'm thinking of one of the street profits instead of one of the private profits because I, they, I don't know they came along with a, a team in each company that looked almost exactly the same and the same gimmick and dressed up and etc and whatever well, well let's private. find out let's see if i'm right or you're wrong let's see if i'm right or you're right i guess is the way I should put it. hey wait a minute now does everyone have a moot face jim would you keep jake hager of the jericho appreciation Society? oh my god captain moop himself <laughs> <laughs> the charismatic jake hager would you keep him on your what roster? has jake hager done to this day he has not had one good match he never speaks much less cuts a good promo he hardly ever wrestles to begin with and even when he's ringside as a stooge for Jericho, he looks like he's a lost ball in high weeds, screaming, find me, find me. What the fuck? He's awkward and has two left feet. How did this guy even get in the fucking business? Well, he was, I think, someone that Jerry Briscoe may have gone after. He was a wrestler. And I think well, he was a wrestler in Oklahoma, actually. As well, see, that just proves that even the great ones amongst us sometimes make a misjudgment. But for AEW, he's Jericho's boy, and everyone knows that. What about Jay Lethal? <sighs> I think everybody Can he be repaired? Now, Can he be repaired? I guess that's the big... Well, I mean, none of, of this that we're talking about is ever going to happen anyway. This is a completely made-up, pulled-out-of-our-ass scenario where I'm choosing who to keep and who to get rid of, but Jay Lethal would be a fucking stellar addition to any goddamn wrestling roster or locker room not only for his promos but for his ability in the ring for his look for his attitude he's another guy when we worked with him at ring of honor he didn't have any bad outside the ring habits he's not going to show up impaired he was always on time for appearances autograph sessions did the pr talked to the tv stations whatever that's a guy you want to have and you want to use and he's still young enough to fucking have a bright future. And they brought him in and beat him and beat him again and beat him again and then fucking stuck him in with a goddamn bunch of dipshits that either on his side or that he was opposed to. And that goddamn Zippy the Giant Pinhead 
That's been hanging around Jay's neck. Sometimes it's criminal what they have done to talent, FTR, lethal, et cetera, et cetera. He, so, yes, lethal goes in the keeper column. Well, look both ways before you cross the street. Jeff Hardy. As bad as I hate to say it, no, Jeff does not make the cut. Because at this point, yes, he's a he's a big name and a big star and people like him. But at what point do you want to be responsible for a fucking nearly middle-aged guy or nearly 50-year-old guy at this point now fucking killing himself? And or taking him around the country where he'll be exposed to more bad influences. No, Jeff does not need to be in the ring at this point doing the things that he feels he has to do to be Jeff Hardy. What about John Silver of the Dark Order? What about him? All right, I think that answers that. Here's an interesting one for you. Jungle Boy. Jack Perry. <sighs> Two years ago, three years ago, I said, boy, if, again, great-looking underdog babyface kid has that white meat babyface face on him. And when he was with people who knew what they were doing he can sell and then he had some fire on his comeback his matches made sense if he's in there with his friends and all the rest of his current generation then it's just bullshit just flipping and flopping and the thing with the dinosaur <sighs> no promo to speak of whatsoever no personality to speak of whatsoever I thought as he grew into this that that might come out, but it's not. Apparently, nobody's trying to bring it out. He's been there a long time doing the same shit and has spun his wheels because of the booking and because he does not grow. He doesn't get bigger. I'm not talking size-wise. I'm talking about talent-wise. He hasn't stopped doing the flippy matches. He still hadn't learned how to lead himself to where he makes sense. He doesn't do a promo with any passion whatsoever. I I think we need to find another young, good-looking baby face at this point. What about Limitless Keith Lee? <sighs> you gotta keep him. There's something there. If we can get him to sound mad instead of fucking like Fraser Crane and and use the physical attributes he's got. I'm not willing to give up on him yet, but he does seem like that maybe they knew what they were doing when they fired him up north because he looks like the Hulk and he acts like Bruce Banner, and it just kind of slows shit down. It has everyone's nickname above their name, like Limitless Keith Lee or Super Bad Kip Sabian, I'll ask you about in a moment, but oh, Executive Vice President Kenny Omega. Yeah. What do you think, Brian? I think you would try to get some value out of him. No, I wouldn't, because here's the thing. I am disgusted by the motherfucker's existence in the wrestling industry that this guy can do the things he's done in front of witnesses and still call himself a professional wrestler and have people like the demented Uncle Dave and the Alzheimer's for Lunch Bunch say, oh, he's the greatest wrestler in the world. He should have had his legs broken and been left in a ditch for what he did to the wrestling business in front of paying customers. And I will never forgive that. And I wouldn't hire that fucking guy for a wrestling company and reward him by calling him a professional wrestler after the activities he's been involved in. If you dipped him in glue and drug him through Fort Knox and he came out covered in seven million dollars in gold i wouldn't give him 15 fucking cents also as i've mentioned every time he opens that fucking pie hole of his and starts spouting off i have come to the conclusion that even if i hadn't seen him wrestle a fucking six-year-old girl or a blow-up sex doll or dressed as a goddamn i dream of genie or sticking his fingers up other guys asses in wrestling matches I would still dislike the motherfucker and not want to spend five minutes in the uh, same room with him because I can tell that we are completely, uh, maybe even more than me and shit stain, completely opposite human beings. And I don't see why anybody would want to associate 
with twinkle toes. And so therefore, I don't care if he can beat the reanimated corpse of Luthez. He does not deserve to be rewarded for his indiscretions by being called a professional wrestler. Fuck Kenny Omega. And fish heads. I would put my money on the reanimated corpse of Luthez in that battle, but... yeah. Jim, there's a lot here. We're going to at least get through M. We may have to continue this on the drive <laughs> There's a, Jesus Christ. What, how, we're going to have to count these at the end also. What about super bad Kip Sabian? Yeah, what about him? Um, seriously, are, is it children's wrestling? Is this the Romper Room Wrestling Association? If I need somebody to fucking crawl into my attic in a tight space and fix something, I'll call Kip Sabian. If I want a grown man, I'll call a grown man. And those the two things are mutually exclusive. Would you call Kyle O'Reilly? Yes, I would. If he can ever wrestle again after whatever they've done to him that he just had surgery. We've talked about it. Kyle O'Reilly is the one guy that has made an MMA-influenced style work for him. He does things differently, but he's very athletic. He's not the biggest dog in the fight, but he's rangy and makes you believe what he's doing. is He's kind of serious. And he was basically stuck. He should have been actually equally as good of an addition as Adam Cole. And instead... He was stuck subservient to Adam Cole, and Adam Cole was made to look like a fucking complete idiot from the start. And Kyle got lost in the shuffle. Yeah, remember, he didn't come over with Adam Cole. He stayed in NXT a little bit after that, and they started using him better. But then when he went to AEW, he was just right back to being Adam Cole's flunky. Yeah, and a flunky of people that we now we don't even ever see. So, but I love Kyle O'Reilly and his different style and his serious approach to the business. And he just landed in fucking fantasy land. Well, maybe he'll make better decisions now that he's not driving around with Bobby Fish. But Jim, what about the murder hawk monster, Lance Archer? I don't have anything against Lance. The only thing, I wish he wouldn't do that goofy rope walk and into a moonsault in every match because he's so big and so strong and such a badass looking guy. That looks so phony. It takes you out of it. In the ring, he's he's okay. I'm not going to say he's goddamn Jack Briscoe. But he's got size and he's got a mean look and a demeanor. But then they they made him a complete laughing stock from the start when they would do the phony shit with him where he would be preceded out of the entrance way by he'd throw one of the production assistants or somebody he happened to snatch in the hallway. He'd throw him out first and he'd beat him up or carry him to the ring or whatever. It's all fake and it's all stupid and nobody believed it. And then he was pushed for a while and then he disappeared. And plus he was saddled with Jake and Jake has no idea how to get anybody over but himself. Jake always was alleged to have a brilliant mind for psychology of wrestling, and he did for himself and what worked for him. I've worked with him on a creative team. Everybody's, oh, Jake's experienced. He's got good booking ideas. No, he fucking doesn't. I worked with him on the creative team until Vince even got fed up with it, which was only like two or three months. He doesn't have any good ideas for anybody but himself. He doesn't have good promos for anybody but himself. And a lot of wrestlers were like that. They could get themselves over, but they can't do it for somebody else. So all those things Archer was a victim of. I'd keep the individual if we could spread mass hypnosis around as far as how he's been exposed thus far. What about Big Shotty Lee Johnson? I, I think we have to let Lee find another line of work right now because what the fuck? We haven't seen him in months, and he was one of the interchangeable guys with a go go and Angelico and Garcia and Del Fugo Del Sol and Griff Garrison, and it's all just hanging around. Yes, I'm sure they can do some good wrestling moves, but we can't 
fucking employ everybody. This is not make a wish, even though Tony runs it like that. Next, next name. What about not shoddy Lee Moriarty? I can't remember him. Which one is he? He's the one that's in the firm, I think. The firm? You mean with fucking Eric Clapton and Robert Palmer and? <laughs> no, I mean the firm with Stokely Hathaway. Oh, oh, and Robert uh, Palmer and. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah. If if he comes back as Professor Moriarty, Sherlock Holmes is arch rival and nemesis, then I'll take it. Well, what about Luchasaurus? Yeah, how quick can we get a fucking truck pulled up to haul him out of here? Now, he is one that previously in the past you thought there were things they could do with him, specifically early on with the tag team with Jungle Boy. And that horse has left the barn a long time ago. Because now we've seen he never changes his matches. He's obviously a blithering idiot. Because he looks like that, and yet he's got to backflip in every match. He's a giant, a giant muscle builder that could work like a monster. And I've seen a picture of him now without his mask, so the mask looks cool, as long as you don't see that fucking... He's got dreadlocks, for fuck's sake. A white guy with Whoopi Goldberg's fucking hairdo. He can't work, he can't put a match together. He can do flips, but if you smashed him, if you just said, okay, here's this big, dumb muscle head... And he's going to listen to every word that we say and do everything we tell him to do. You could get him over to steal a pay-per-view or to steal a show. You could smash him over smaller guys quickly, decisively, then do an angle with a top baby face that was a good worker. And that guy could get a match, a main event match, once out of Luchasaurus. But then he would be exposed and you would have stolen the pay-per-view and then you got to get rid of Luchasaurus because he can't do anything on his own and he's a complete idiot. And I'll be goddamn if I would stand there for the minute that it takes him to set this shit up and let a 280 pound fucking giant six and a half foot bodybuilder backflip blind off of a high place and land on me elbows, knees, back of his head, his big bulbous ass, whatever the fuck was going, I'd be gone. Well, looking at someone here who has uh, risen from just a wrestler to, through hard work, dedication, and of course, supreme wrestling intellect becoming a producer, what about Luther of the Chaos Project? <laughs> Why don't you go down to the county drunk tank and pick out any other fat, bald fucker? and put them in the ring drunk, the match would be the same. Remember the match he had on TV when they were trying to put him on TV where he actually fell off the apron by accident when nobody had touched him? Well, look, it pays to be friends with Chris Jericho. But it's a 50-something-year-old a fat guy that was an indie wrestler that nobody had ever heard of 30 years ago. And but he's I've, friends with Chris Jericho, that's I've enough. I've got a bunch of friends that nobody has ever heard of, and we're going to keep it that way. That's that's not an excuse. Tony is the boss. And if you just took Does he one know look, that? No, he doesn't. <laughs> but it, take one look at this fat fuck Luther that's 50-something years old, never had a career in wrestling to begin with, worked in outlaw matches in Japan and rec centers in parts of Canada, couldn't get picked out of a police lineup, was the shits to begin with, then did death matches, then took 20 years off in some drunk tank somewhere, I guess. I don't know. And then Chris Jericho called and said, you're not going to believe the kind of person I just met. Exactly. And Luther comes back to wrestling. And I'm sorry that the truth hurts, but somebody disagree with me so that we can all laugh at you that Dr. Luther was ever a name of any size, status, or recognition in the wrestling business on any major level anywhere, the answer is not no, but fuck no. And Tony Khan was conned into fucking giving this guy, one assumes, a couple thousand dollars a month at least. And that contribute your money to charity and it would it would be useful. Or just give it to this guy to fucking waller around and take up space. 
what wrestler is going to listen to somebody that looks like that, that works like that? We've seen his work, and it's reprehensible. And that they never did anything to begin with. But he's friends with Chris Jericho. What other qualifications does he need? Oh, my God. Speaking of someone who's a name. It's like when they made Disco Inferno an agent in fucking TNA just because Russo got a kick out of him. And there's Disco Inferno trying to tell fairly big wrestling stars what to fucking do. This is 20 times worse. At least Disco Inferno was on television in this country. Or even on television. The outlaw shows he worked in Japan. Luther wasn't on TV. Luther. Fuck. Someone who was on TV, Jim, do you keep Mark Henry, the world's strongest man? Keep him doing what? What's he fucking doing? He has an interview segment on Rampage that lasts about 90 seconds. Did it? I thought he did, but... Has it been seen lately? Nobody watches Rampage to find out. Yeah, truth be told, I don't know, but apparently, according to this, he has a career record of zero and zero in AEW. Well, yeah, I, and he's got a bad back. And and I love Mark Henry, and Mark's had a long career, and we helped train him, and I've never had a crossword with him until he went nuts and got all dramatic over my goddamn chicken joke a few years ago, and then I was disappointed in him. And... But that, but he can't wrestle anymore, so I thought they were going to make him an announcer, but then they backed up on that. They signed him with big fanfare. So I don't have a problem with employing Mark Henry, but what is it exactly they want him to do there? Right, you could find something for a guy like that to do, but they haven't. Go ahead. What about smart Mark Sterling? Yeah, boy. Can we... Just set him on fire. He gives managers I don't think a bad so. name. No, we can't just set him on fire. That's against okay. the rules. Can we throw him out a window? Possibly. That may be with All the right. rules. Yeah, but only if it's on the first floor, I guess. Yes, and as long as there's no fire involved. You already said you would keep Mark Quinn of Private Party. Yeah. Matt Hardy of the Hardys. <sighs> I, you know, if he was younger, I'd say, my God, they did the the horrible gimmicks, the bad angles. He switched back and forth from babyface to heel. He's cheating people on their contracts. Then he speaks as himself for one week. Then he teleports to another dimension. Then he looks like Beatrice Arthur in Vincent Price's fucking wardrobe. Then he's come back to being big money Matt. Then he's got brain damage because they killed him again. If he was younger, I'd say, go away and come back when they miss you, but he doesn't have that much time left. So I don't see what they've made him so meaningless. And when you see Matt's face on that TV show now, you know, oh, my God, this is going to suck. And it's going to involve every underneath talent they can't figure out something to do with. So, no, unfortunately, no. What about executive vice president Matt Jackson of the Young Bucks? Oh, and let's and him and his brother both. That's the reason why that this company has self-destructed. And they they brought their initial small group of simpleton fans that enjoy their bullshit. They got just big enough that they could sway Tony Khan that oh, we could have a brand new, you know, revolutionary wrestling promotion until it got on television. You see that that's what you see from these two, every fucking match, same thing, same thing, same thing, never changes, never serious, visually ridiculous, smarmy promos that sound fake and annoy you at the same time. The ridiculous wardrobe, the flunkies, that they get jobs, high-paying jobs for, that accompany them around in their group because they think they're important. They're a blight on the leaf of the wrestling plant. So both young bucks immediately get exiled to goddamn Buckville. Send them back to Cucamonga. Yeah, maybe they could transform Pro Wrestling Gorilla into being a big thing, but... 
What about Matt Menard, Daddy Magic of the Jericho Appreciation Society? Well, remember we bopped uh, bopped him up in 2.0. Yeah, if we get him away from Jericho and they got some oomph to him, let's see what they've got. We might could make him serious. Matt Seidel. <sighs> nice kid. Is he still there? Hadn't seen him in months. Uh, very small. Um, I have to I have to say that we could probably do better. Some some other new guy that has not been exposed to be a a twat in their booking. Michael Nakazawa. Ah, he looks like the. <laughs> I never thought this, but looking at the picture of him, he looks like you ever seen the movie Mac and Me. Yes. The alien Mac. He looks yes. just like fucking Mac. In this movie. Okay, let me ask you this question. <laughs> yeah. Who defends his presence? That do even the the trampoline cowboy fans that like the the Cucamonga kids and that whole play group there from old pro wrestling fucking chimpanzee, do they even give a shit for this guy? Has anybody ever liked this guy or given a shit? Remember they had him on television wrestling in the opening weeks of AEW. He's the guy that would pull baby oil out of his tights squirt baby oil all over himself, and then they couldn't get a hold on him. Has he ever had a, not even a good match? Has he ever had an acceptable match? Has he ever done a promo? Has he ever contributed anything to the wrestling business otherwise than standing around and holding Kenny Olivier's dick in his fucking hand because he's the dick-holding flunky? The answer is no. He is just Kenny Omega stooge. He means nothing to anyone in America, and I don't even think too many Japanese wrestling fans are big Michael Nakazawa fans. He's he there. wasn't a Japanese wrestler. He did, like, outlaw shit that the p people in Japan don't even know is happening. It's not like he got this great Japanese wrestler to come from Tokyo. It's a fucking stooge that played wrestling in Japan until his friend got him a job to play wrestling in America. So no, he's out. He's gone. Set fire to the fucking room in the bed that he was sleeping in in case he left lice. Jim, what about the Redeemer, Miro? You gotta keep that fucking guy. He may be a fucking complete psychopath. He may not be that bright, but he looks great. And he had good matches that brief period of time after they finished him playing with his little friend Pip and Penelope Pitstop, he came out as a beast and beating the shit out of people and cutting these weird promos, mad at God. And then he disappeared again. But if you get the good Miro, I'd keep him. This one's probably a layup. MJF. Oh, no, I don't know if we've got room for him. Yeah, how fast can I give him a $5 million raise? $5 million raise? Yeah. All right. That was an easy negotiation. Jim, from the House of Black, Malachi Black. Well, you've got a guy that just said he didn't want to wrestle, so I would take him at his word. I'd say, okay, you signed a contract with me to wrestle. <laughs> I'm stupid enough that I signed you for allegedly five years. So now you go home because you don't want to wrestle and I'll pay you so you don't go anywhere else and make me look further like an idiot. But this guy's been a disappointment since the start. He Remember, he looked good. We thought, okay, the guy looks like a badass. Had some buzz about him, came in. Did the thing with Cody, okay. And then all of a sudden, Supernatural City came in. And every match of his, he would have a good match that would go in the toilet because he was playing some kind of spooky mind games with people. And then he gets a group around him and they cater to him until he realizes he ain't getting over. And then he wants to go back to where he kind of got over a little better and can't get out of his contract and then decides he wants to take time off from wrestling. I'd give him all the time off from wrestling he wants because I don't think you can save this guy from his own mind because he's an idiot. Well, Jim, two more names here today, and again, we'll finish this more than likely on the drive through this week. Yeah, because I didn't know that Tony was giving out all this goddamn free money. <laughs> 
It is a lot when you read it like this. We we are we are closing in on a hundred names right now. Just me writing these down on a legal pad with generally twenty six lines. I'm I'm coming up at almost a hundred, and we're at the M's. The next name I'm going to give you, I have to say, looking at the photo of him here, he looks like a monster. It looks like a classic wrestler, someone you could do something with. Whenever you see him in the ring, he has size, he has a look, and then they beat him and don't do anything with him, so I don't know if they just don't think he's worth it. But Nick Camarado of the factory. I'd take him in a second. I would, because he's a, not only he's got the fucking physique, but also the wild hair and the beard. He, you could give him a gimmick and, and you could get it over and he doesn't have, again, who gives a shit about great wrestling matches? We're talking about getting talent over. It's two completely separate things. And especially with what the people consider great wrestling matches now that are fucking abysmal. Take a guy like that, give him a gimmick, give him a manager, get, put him in a group, give him a partner, somebody to fucking help lead him as he gets experience, and you could do something with that guy, because he looks like a gimmick. I would keep Camarado in a heartbeat, see what I could get out of him. And the final name today, part one of Jim's look at the AEW roster and who he would keep and who he would get rid of, it's Sockeye, Nick Jackson of the Young Bucks. Well, I believe I just grouped him with his fucking brother. And Mama Buck should have swallowed that night. And that way we'd have got rid of both of them. Although after seeing Papa Buck, I have a feeling the mailman had something to do with it. Because I don't think Papa Buck did that on his own. All right. Well, he looks we... just as fucking simpy and fucking... <laughs> Jesus Christ is the rest of them. It looks like a 60-year-old fucking... How can a guy that looks like a 60-year-old hippie from California be a right-wing religious lunatic? Ignorance? I don't know. So this... So hold on here a second. One, two, three. One, two, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. The ladybugs play at the ladybugs picnic. 20, 21, 22, 23, 25, <laughs> 6, 7, 8, 9, 30, 31, 32. And there's another 55... We're at 75 people and we're only to the M's and half these people we haven't seen on television in months. What a fucking... <laughs> this is a goddamn Chinese fire drill. It's not a talent roster. There's no, no thought went into this whatsoever. There's no pattern. There's no concept here. There's no, okay, this talent works because of the style of wrestling I'm presenting. There's no pre-plan. There's no... There's no plan. There's no thought. It's just... People walk up in front of him and somebody says, this guy's a friend of mine. He's real good. Sign him. And he does. And he's ended up with, can you imagine if you put a zoo together like this, you'd have the anteaters next to the goddamn possums, next to the goddamn tigers, next to the chimpanzees, next to the one-celled amoeba. And what if any the of them fuck? were friends with an emu, they'd get a job right away. That's right. And you know those emus. Is it well, that's your favorite place, right? Emus Pizza? No, it's Emo's Pizza. Oh. It's Lemu the Emu. Lemu Emu and Doug. Liberty Mutual. Lemu the Emu and <laughs> Doug. All right. Anyway, so we're stopping here, is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, we're doing Lim Limo Emo or whatever the fuck his name is. I think yeah. we're at the end of the uh the rope this week. <laughs> Lim All right, Limu we'll, Emu, that's what it is. We'll finish. I'm keeping this piece of paper, and we're going to finish this up on the drive through and then we'll we'll look at who we've kept, and then we'll pare that down to an actual roster of talent, and and maybe illustrate that you can have some level of rationality to when you're putting a roster together, so everybody can work with everybody instead of having a goddamn complete clusterfuck. This is like the Tower of Babel of wrestling rosters. Almost nobody speaks <laughs> the same language. Well, I'm sure they'll be really uh, appreciative of the comparison to the Tower of Babel, but Jim... Well, it's no wonder all the matches suck, because they, it, it's all a, a clash of styles and personalities and experience and concept of wrestling. Just so you are aware, after the remainder of the men's roster, the other rosters listed here are the women's roster as well as the broadcast team, the referees, and the coaches. So we can go through all of this after the 
Vicky Guerrero's a coach. I guess I didn't realize. Oh, that. good lord! What? She's li- the coaches listed are Arn Anderson, Billy Gunn, Jerry Lynn, Pat Buck, and Vicky Guerrero. Maybe she's I'm helping not- them with their promos. Oh lord! Or hip tosses. I'm not, or something. I'm not knocking Vicky, but what would she coach? She wasn't even ever in the business until Eddie died, and then she's been a manager. She's never had a legitimate match. But very, very few manager matches. But what you're not looking at is she's very good friends with Chris Jericho. All right, it's my show. Can I close it up? Yeah, it is your show. You can do whatever you want. All right, in that case, come back on the drive through for Brian's show, and we'll go through the rest of this roster as well as whatever the fuck else comes up between now and then. And until then, thank you for joining us. Fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody.